Welcome, friends. It's almost midnight, and you've found your way to the Pikecast. Come along as we careen through the catalog of the most formative horror writer of our young adult days, Christopher Pike. From adult perspectives, we'll revisit these YA books our parents probably would never have let us read had they known what lie inside. We tackle one book per episode in a freewheeling and unbiased chat. So grab your battered paperback, pull the flashlight from the kitchen drawer, climb under your bed covers, and devour a good book with us. Greetings, fellow Pikers, and welcome to the Pikecast. I'm Cooper Beckett, and I'm thrilled to be joined by my lovely co host, Cassie. Hello. Before we get started, we want to take a moment to bid a fond farewell to our amazing co-host, Becca, who has left the show because life has gotten in the way, as I'm sure we all can understand. We love her and will miss her terribly. So thank you for all your contributions, Becca, and you will always have a home on the Pikecast. Sugar Sisters for life. <laughs> yes. Today we are digging into Christopher Pike's 1995 adult novel, The Cold One. We're going to be dissecting it in great detail, spoiling each and every plot twist, so consider yourself warned. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave us a review on the podcast service of your choice. And let's welcome our returning guest, Piker, this week, the author of numerous horror books, including The Worm and His Kings, and short story collection, Unfortunate Elements of My Anatomy, Haley Piper. We're thrilled to have you back, Haley. I'm so glad to be back. <laughs> and uh, we, we saw, I, I saw on Twitter that uh, that everybody has feelings about this book. <laughs> I don't think you could read this book and not have feelings. <laughs> like, this is definitely not a eh, whatever kind of book. Yeah, this, this is not a meh book. <laughs> this is this is a uh, yeah, it's, it's very uh, engaged. So this is is one of his adult novels, and we we have a little bit different artwork on this book. Uh, it looks very similar to the season of passage, in that it's just faces. <laughs> really, um, Cassie, do you have the, to have the back of the book? I do. It's just like a small snippet. Yeah, it's barely okay. anything. Yeah, well, it's better than last time where they is. outright lied. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> In the cold one, Christopher Pike creates a villain whose soft touch can wither a person's soul, whose great beauty conceals a black heart, and whose breath carries death in every exhalation. An emotionless being of great and ancient evil, the cold one exists only to destroy mankind. Dun dun dun. Okay, that's that's pretty that's literally accurate. It. Yeah. What's inside? Yeah. It is, yeah. When he keeps it short, it's very accurate, I think. <laughs> but when he tries to get like really long with it, he starts throwing in lies. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I mean that yeah, the I mean the cover it's just faces, so it could be anyone really in the There's world. a tiny a tiny cold one in the eye. <laughs> there's a there's a tiny cold one? Yeah, there's like a little tiny Yeah, like, there's a little person. thing. A white, is like, it, okay, I gotta, I gotta look close at this. Uh, is it a fetus? Clearly. Oh, is it a fetus? I, don't know. I thought it was fetus? like somebody running, but maybe. <laughs> no shit. Because it does say it has like more tail like than legs or something. Oh my god, hold on. <laughs> oh, that's not a fetus. What is it? It's like a, it's like a, a sprinting, leaping. <laughs> yeah, it, it looks like specter. it's sprinting. It, it looks like a. Uh, it's a phantom. In my kind like of you see on a, on a, a running. Uh, um, Sign. In my defense, I got a used copy, and that <laughs> is scratched out a little bit, so you can't really tell what it is. Okay, I have no defense. Fair. I was just going with the fetus thing. <laughs> well, thankfully, it's not the fetus because that would just be really overplaying its hand here. Because that fetus was one of the biggest surprises I've ever, uh, I've ever encountered. In a but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Um, so to those playing along at home, uh, you will know that this book had so many characters and, um, they all sort of get set up like they're going to be the main character of the book and then they're not. 
So um, I've trimmed down the number of characters that we're going to be talking about in the Midnight Club. And some people may disagree with me with why I trimmed them down or whether or not they were important or such. Uh, but, you know, it's it's hard to do this. So, yeah, there we go. If you don't like it, go start your own Christmas yes. thing. <laughs> As Bender would say, with blackjack and hookers. <laughs> Uh, so let's let's get into it. So let's start with Peter Jacobs, with his golden curls and arresting green eyes, his great body and smooth voice. Oh, that's all I got. I missed <laughs> his description. So the whole time I just pictured him with like dark straight hair. I don't know why. Well, it's 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 later in the book that he gives this description, and honestly, it comes after one of the best sentences ever. Uh, look, he looks like the good priest who would never think of molesting children. <laughs> that that may be the greatest description sentence God, ever written. This book. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Peter, so Peter's Peter's a a, a a player, a ladies' man. He's he's a, a journalist who writes happy-go-lucky journalism. Uh, he's a hard-hitting reporter who promises literally everyone he talks to that he will never write about this. <laughs> what do we think of Peter? He, I mean, he's just basic. He, that's how he I feel, too. He's he's very milk toast. Yeah. Yeah. I wish, uh, honestly, I wish Julie had been the the main character. Me too. Book. She 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 had such a like good Pike vibe, like. For his YA books, she felt like one of the heroines from those, so I liked her a bit more. Well, honestly, Peter felt like uh, one of the YA men characters too, but, you know, like <laughs> which isn't a compliment. The ones that he doesn't care a lot about, so it's just like, and then this guy was there. He he seems to kind of mosey through the plot, like yeah. whereas whereas Julie is kind of actually trying to like find things out and do mm -hmm. things. And he has a roommate, yeah. Matthew Bill. Who I feel like he had just read The Stand and wanted his own Tom Cullen. I've never read that. Oh. Well, I didn't think of that. Stand. I didn't think of that. But now that you say that, yeah. Well, and Tom Cullen <laughs> is an overgrown, uh, developmentally and, challenged yeah. um, man. Uh, and, I mean, he's, he's just a, a good, you know, one of he's the... good natured. Like, um, to to use a terrible term, the magic Negro trope. There's also the magic uh, developmentally disabled character. So trope. it's like like somebody's supposed to like take care of them, like in this book, like Is somebody's supposed to take care of them, but they're also like better than everybody else and because they're, like... they're not burdened with um, an overgrown mind. Okay, you know, yep. yeah, it's. But so they're seen as like really like innocent and sweet and need to be yeah, protected, exactly. but then they're Again, also usually like, sacrificed yeah. and stuff. Yeah. 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 Um yeah. and like so. and like the funny thing is I got that vibe, that stand vibe too. And there's a scene in the stand where like another presence takes over with, mm -hmm. with Tom. And I almost like that seemed like such a pike like I'm surprised Pike didn't grab for that because that book had been around for a while by then. Yeah. And with the whole NDE thing and like it didn't like it seemed like something he planted there explicitly to take advantage of that and then just never never went that far never never bothered well that's the funny thing about this book is it feels a lot like it, you know we we talk a lot about his other books having too many characters and also characters that feel like they're going to be much more important than they are um but we assume that those were written in this ridiculously quick fashion because he had deadlines for his team books. I wouldn't have assumed that was the case with his adult books, but it may just be the way he writes, which is, I'm just going to throw everything I can in there, and maybe some stuff is going to connect, and maybe it isn't, which is fine. It just can come across as weird. Like, Matthew has very, very little to do except be a reason 
for Peter to sacrifice himself. Right. I, I felt and, that too because they set up that whole newspaper thing and then Matthew, he disappears for like 200 pages. Mm-hmm. I think it's also supposed to show though that like that's why Peter's different from Sarah or Leslie or Sandra or whatever her name is because <laughs> he like while they are you find out later that they're like twins or whatever he spent he's known Matt since they were in like a home when they were children so like he's always had this sense of like caring and protecting like protection for other people whereas Sarah was just cold her entire life she didn't have friends when she was younger she didn't have anything like or Ruth right. or I forgot her she has like four names she was she Ruth uh, for, in the family yeah Ruth, Ruth Leslie and I think Leslie no she was Ruth Sarah and then she got adopted and became Leslie Smith by like the California oh, family after right. she yeah way too family. many names yeah it is it, that's another thing too is like Pike loves to have too many characters and then when he has a cast of like 20 <laughs> characters he gives them all a second name like or third or fourth like why what are you doing this for yeah I I do need to read some of uh some of Matt's um description here never mind that Matt was 6'4 220 pounds of uncertain animation his body had the strength and lack of coordination of a high school lineman on extra strength steroids. He had a flat face. He'd run into a few things with it, but his teeth were straight and incredibly white. He brushed and flossed several times a day. His dark brown hair was always combed and his clothes were always clean and pressed. It was true he looked slow and talked even slower, but he was never anything but friendly. And that... that it it comes across as as a really nice inclusion, but it feels like an icky inclusion, right? And I mean, he's not a he's not a bad character. He just isn't important. And I think that's the case of of a lot of these miscellaneous characters. Is ultimately, if I'm an editor and I want to streamline, okay, we can lose half your characters, just real easily. Because he, he goes out of his way to give us backstory on so many of them that are so unimportant. And it's very front-loaded backstory, too. It is. It is. Um, let's move on to Lieutenant Amos Rodriguez, who gives Peter Jacobs a lot of leeway <laughs> while just telling him, you're not a cop, man. But okay, you go be a cop. He's like, I can't control you. Because <laughs> <laughs> he keeps uh, telling him, don't do this. And then Peter goes and does it. And it's like, ah, shucks. Oh, you <laughs> incorrigible scamp. I honestly, I feel like the whole part with the cop and his little coroner friend just could have been not there. Because I, I just... Uh... I that. didn't like those parts. I was skimming because I was like, "This sucks." Like, I don't like. Oh, this. you missed some choice. All, I like. You might miss some choice nonsense. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I I was reading most of it, but I will say, like, I was kind of like forwarding to the dialogue between them because I was just mm -hmm. like, "There's a lot of just walking and standing and like thinking hard." Like, mm. well, let's uh, let's get the description here for Lieutenant Amos Rodriguez. He was not a handsome man. Although his Hispanic profile was strong and proud, he was short, fit. At 40, he could run a five-minute mile. His right eye was plastic, a reminder of a violent childhood. It was always staring, but fortunately in the right direction. His black hair was thick, always neat. He moved with confidence. He, he comes across like a lot of the cops in Pike stories. Yeah. Um, notably, uh, the cop in, what was it? Remember me where they're just allowed to, no, no, it was monster. I don't know. <laughs> it was the, one the of them that just like, that let uh, the, the teenager. teenage girl solve the crime. <laughs> it could have been any number. It, it really, it <laughs> right, really could. I'm like, I listened to that episode. Which one was it? I don't know. <laughs> Listeners tell us which one it was. <laughs> Because we can't remember. They blend. Okay, let's move on to blank. Cool. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so seriously, this character is so unnecessary, but he's so damn interesting. <laughs> 
Uh, Amos had told stories about him over dinner. Blank wore a po- blonde punk crew cut. He was tall and gangly and remarkably pale. It was no exaggeration to say he resembled a cadaver. And his hands were large with fish-like fingers. <laughs> what this, does that This mean? is the medical examiner. <laughs> What are fish like fingers? Do they look like fish? I don't These know. fish don't have like, fingers. I they, don't know. Okay, so they even comment that like Peter is like, why is he here? <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine, friend. Yeah. I mean, I I know he's he's unimportant, but he's more interesting than L- Lieutenant Rodriguez. He's more interesting than Peter. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I kept waiting for him to be a bad guy because, like, they set it up so strongly that he's going to be extra creepy or something. Especially with, like, the incest and stuff. Like, later, I'm just like, where is Blank in this? Because earlier, if I can read a a little thing real quick. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't have taken no for an answer, Blank said. I never do. (laughs) That's because you work with dead people all day and they never argued with you, Peter said. That's a lot. There's a lot to be said for the dead. Blank agreed. <laughs> I don't know. I really, I wish he didn't exist in this book. I'm going to be honest with you guys, because that, I just don't like him. He's creepy. No, like, I don't like him even, either. He's not even just creepy and like, oh, what a quirky, creepy, cool person. You know, it's just like, ew, like, well, let get me make away. A He's played by Crispin Glover in a movie. Hmm. I'm really bad with names. I got to look at, I got to look it up. Uh, uh, well, Marty Crispin Glover is most, yeah, both, most notably oh, George McFly. Okay. But he's also a really, really creepy, weird actor. Like, he, he makes the most creepy decisions when he acts, usually. <laughs> um, he would be fascinating in this role. They'd have to make it more important. Because right now, the studio executive seeing this script is like, can we just lift this guy out, just like completely? Because it doesn't matter. Okay, Jerry Washington, who uh, Haley has already said she wishes wasn't in the book. It's not that. I just <laughs> don't. I if if he wasn't there, nothing would have changed. But, That's true. But, okay. Yeah. No, it, I, it is better I that don't... he's there. <laughs> It's, I don't know if I would say better, though, but, like, okay, so his depiction, like, the whole writing of him is terrible. So let's all yes. agree on that. Like, it's racist yes. and it's bad. It's super like, racist. The only black person is a member of a gang. Like, just like how in Remember Me, like, all the Hispanic people were mm-hmm. like, oh, they're all, like, troubled youth with guns. Like, wh- Right. Yeah. And he was talking yeah. about the burrito, and I'm just like, Pike, I don't think you know much about Los Angeles gangs. Yeah, it's just, well, it's wild. I, I, for first, I mean, okay. Um, <laughs> Where to start? I need to, I need to mention these other gang members. They <laughs> have the names. Oh, yes, these Clear names. Gel. There's Clear Gel, a pimp and drug dealer. With two L's, that's my favorite Yeah, part. <laughs> there's Freddy Fist Forum. <laughs> Unelected, but still much respected leader of the Black Ties. <laughs> South Central's badass answer to the Brown Motherfuckers and Company. I can't. <laughs> I mean, it's, and it's Company. What is in Company? Why didn't they edit this stuff out? I just... Okay, okay, look. So, like, okay, so what I was saying was all the racist part aside, though, I. I do like that he's in the book and that him and uh, what's her name? Susan, darling, Susan, yeah. that they have their side plot because that I remember and it, it had this same but lesser impact now. But when I was a kid, I remember like reading that and being so like sad because that's like one of the most tragic pockets of the story to me is like this guy who has like a really rough life and he meets this girl and is like, wow, things are going to get better for me. And then she's like a fucking murderer who and like they, yeah, they murders get so and much kills worse. him. Yeah. Like, and then, like the, the conversations they have and like her creepiness as this like beautiful blonde, like preppy, like young, innocent thing turned very bad. Like, I just love it so much. Like it's mm. so, I don't know. It's not even like, it's kind of Jennifer's body ish, but it, Jennifer wasn't really like exactly the same, but still it has that same vibe and I just, it's wrong and I like it. So I really, yeah. I'm glad that part of the story is in it, but. But let's the way be honest, Jerry, Jerry Washington did not need to be a black kid from the gangs no, in that's, South yeah, Central. That, that whole part, like that didn't need to exist. Like he could have yeah. just been, maybe had like a rough home life or something like that. Like it didn't have to be racist. 
I mean, that's that's really where you see like there are things that Pike definitely knows about, like Indian history and philosophy. And then there are things he definitely doesn't know about, but really wants to seem like he knows about. Yeah, he's just making it up. Yeah. yeah. Like, like L.A. gang life. L.A. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just this whole gang backstory, like the whole incident. And like, I, I get that it's a very busy action. It's, it's probably the most it's probably the most action that happens in the book up until the mall situation. Yeah, right. But like at the same time, it's just like none of it's necessary to even for Jerry's subplot. Because right. yeah, like, it no. doesn't actually have any bearing because right, he's already out at that point. Right. I feel like he was writing like some of these scenes because he was like, this would make a great movie. Like this looks so good on screen, like the mall and like just like a random car driving into a house. And then right. <laughs> like it's not good for the story, but it would look fun on TV. It would. <laughs> I was I was spending a lot of this movie, this book thinking about what the movie would look like. Because this is very movie feeling. I I hope it gets made into. Also, I don't I don't know where we should put this, but there's no sequel, right? Like there was no. no sequel. There is no, no. sequel. It, but the back says there's going to be, he and I remember the kid a sequel, waiting for and it. There was none. We oh, should ask him about that. We need to, Pike. It's, please. I felt like, and like, not to like, I I don't want to play editor on the book because I hate <laughs> when a reader, like, I hate being a reader doing that, and I try not mm-hmm. to do that, but I just I couldn't help myself with this book, where I was just like, I feel like a good chunk of this only existed to set up the sequel that never happened. Agreed. (laughs) Yeah. Agreed. We're missing out. Well, let's move on to Julie (laughs) Moore. Julie. uh, Who grew up on a farm in Kansas and is now at UCLA writing a doctoral dissertation on the psychology of the near death experience. She's got a bright future in academia ahead of her. That's a joke. (laughs) Because nobody cares about the psychology of near-death experience. I kept... She she was important. She was important. I kept waiting for her research to become important. (laughs) And it seemed like the research was just an excuse to have her meet the other characters. Yes! The research never went anywhere, and I kept wondering, like, where's the near-death stuff going to come in? And it never does. I really thought that was going to be something with the, you know, titular cold one. Like, I was like, oh, did something something come from the other side instead? They even mentioned that at one point. Like, no, it doesn't matter. It's not important. (laughs) Which is weird. It it is it's 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 it feels like a missed opportunity. But I, I get that's not what Pike wanted to write about. But like. And, and that, like I mentioned the Netflix show Dark when I was on last time for the Starlight Crystal and like now I'm going to do another Netflix show, The OA, um, mm. was also about NDEs and it's like, oh, it's so interesting. So like, I wonder what Pike did with it 25 years ago. I was like, nothing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Julie is, Julie is a, a fairly typical Pike heroine in that she's feisty but naive and gets over her head in love with a guy and but also is is able until she's not like the <laughs> death of Julie Moore shocked me that was a that was a harrowing scene though it was and i didn't think they were going that way and then they I mean, they really nuked her character afterwards, though. Yeah. Well, she's like barely the, in there. Any, oh, oh, yeah, the the situation with... Govinda. Should we... I don't know. Like, that's the thing. I'm I'm, I'm having trouble with some of this because I'm like, should this be saved for the problematic well, section or is it all problematic? I mean, we we can talk about it anytime, honestly. Okay. The, this, this stuff. This is going to be a meandering episode. So anytime you want to bring something up, it's is, fine. Is that because it's a meandering book? Yes, that is why. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like I'm, I'm gonna be. I, I just, I, I, I can't help sniping at this book a little bit because I was just, I was so irritated. Just like, where is this going? Nowhere. Where is this going? Nowhere. Um, like there's just so many dropped threads and dropped characters. It feels like, but yeah. So like, her character is interesting. And she's the one who keeps getting in danger. Where while Peter's just moseying along, be like, I guess I'll talk to this person. Peter's 
flying back and forth from Iowa. Right. But then, okay, so then at the end, she's like the reincarnated, uh, blonde, blue-eyed priestess from 5,000 years ago in India, who is now the mother of the goddess Kali incarnate, yeah. if, if I'm understanding everything correctly. Well, I'm not sure if she is, uh, what is it, Sira? I think. I don't know that she is Sira. But yes, she is now, uh, but now she will be giving birth to uh, Kali, yeah, Kali. Yeah. So that's... Is supposed to be wonderful beyond words, horrible beyond imagination. Well, good for that's her. That's from my section called Inside Julie. <laughs> See, the, second, the second book would have been cool, because maybe that little child could have fucked shit up, and we'll never know. Well, we may. I mean, he is... Sort of writing. He's writing I more know. Last Vampire sequels. Yeah, we we gotta we gotta bug him about. Maybe that. he's gonna tie them together somehow. <laughs> well, I mean, they all sort of share a universe because they're all related to Hindu mythology. That's true. And I so I thought this book was about vampires, and rereading it today, I was like, oh, this is why I thought this. This isn't vampires, but this is why I thought this is vampires. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Stephen Adams. Who you both forgot. Yeah, I don't have much to say on Sorry. that person, unfortunately. Well, no, it's fine. I just, the only reason, so, so I have this thing for um, characters like Donald Sutherland in the 90s. You know, he was always an advisory character. He usually had a mustache. Sometimes he died. And I've written characters like that into my books because I love that trope. And that's what Stephen Adams is. Uh, he, he was her advisor for her PhD. He's an Englishman in his late 60s. His suits as well as his groomed hair and mustache were gray. His eyes are gray. Julie thought of him as a modern Van Helsing. His knowledge on the most arcane subjects was vast. If he's a modern Van Helsing, at some point he should have burst in to try to kill the monster. <laughs> right? I, I mean, if he had burst in, maybe he would have made more of an impression because as it stands, I honestly do not remember a single scene with this sir in it. <laughs> now that you've said who he is, I do remember her talking to him a couple times, but he just has not made a single tiny impression on me whatsoever. <laughs> Wasn't he just like, yeah, go talk to this doctor. Yeah, well, yeah he keeps to asking to, to, to see the research. The, the doctor's research? Yeah. So he's the one who wants it, not even her. Oh, because he told well, her to go bother Doctor yeah. Doctor Moray. <laughs> His last name makes me. I like it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I so, kept thinking I, I in mean, my head. I, I wanted again. I wanted a, this character to actually matter. Yeah, but he doesn't. No, and you two forgetting him is an example of how little he matters. The other doctor was more memorable than him. The love triangle doctor. Yeah. Oh, you mean the doctor who stepped on a fetus? Yeah, of course he was no, more no, memorable. No, 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 no. The other oh, one that had the white The other support. doctor I didn't put in. Yeah, who was in right. yeah. with Sandra. Sandra, the yeah. Iowa doctor. Also, yeah, and all, because there's a... Oh, I'll save that, I guess, for problematic. But I did have one thing highlighted from that doctor as well, because he was creepy. He was creepy. But he... he she like, was mine? Yes, the she was mine. Yeah, he's like, yeah. as she was in the beginning. or He's like, now, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, that. I don't like it. I did not <laughs> like it. <laughs> well, that's also very Pike boyfriend stealing right mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Or boyfriend and girlfriend stealing. It's it's very, like, not only was he content to have it be the Julie, Sarah, uh, Peter triangle, but he had to put an old man triangle in there too. Yeah, 30 years ago triangle. Which because well, Sandra and Sarah are the same person, it's a uh, an hourglass. <laughs> yes. It's creepy. Let's move to Dr. Lawrence Moray. A well-known cardiologist, one of the pioneers in the near-death experience field. Uh, <laughs> who doesn't want to ever talk about it who killed his old wife by shoving her off a boat. Smacking um, her in the face. And then she fell off because she oh, like fell down and hit her head or something. 
and then laid face down in the water until she, uh, you know, consumed the cold one. He's <laughs> he's just irritated with everybody. Yeah, he's permanently bitchy. <laughs> and he, uh, I mean, there's there's so much here that he wound up married to his daughter. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I what a flowers in the attic sort of twist too. Like, oh my god, yeah, I, I didn't think they were going to go that far, but and no, he didn't they even did. Know. Yeah. No. And, uh, and he's experimenting on the fetus that won't die, uh, which was superb levels of gross. And and he is just an asshole, but he's also uh, has this side plot where he doesn't want to uh, do this surgery on a, a poor guy, and he does, and then he kills him. That was so weird. That was like, what was it? I just, I'm sure that, I, like, I'm sure Pike wanted to hammer home some sort of parallel because he even says, like, if I hadn't had this day, like, I mm-hmm. wouldn't have been receptive to the message. Like, really? I do. Ugh. That was, get out of here. Which also was kind of like, to me, was like, I, I feel like he was trying to humanize him, but I was just also thinking, it's like, it's kind of too late. Yeah. Like, I yeah. already don't like him. So, shall we talk about Sarah now or Govinda <laughs> Sharma? Uh, that, I mean, let's talk about Govinda Sharma. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Cassie, you know how much I love it when a when a book takes a strong left turn and oh, introduces really us to a whole new uh, set of characters and storyline. Forty pages. It's forty yeah. pages straight of this before it comes back around to anything. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm over here like, yes, rubbing my hands together. Mini story within the story. Well, well let me be clear, <laughs> because his plot line takes place in the present. It still felt like it was moving the story forward for me. That's Although fair. they spend a lot of their time talking about the past. Yeah, but his past was very tragic too, so it was sad. Yeah, he had a he had a, a young wife um, who was pregnant and walked in the store to buy a carton of milk, and a car cruised by filled with loud youths. <laughs> I'm, this is this is a good quote, by the way. A gun was pointed out the window. A shot was fired. Vanny died only a week short of her due date in a dirty street in a pool of blood. See, that's that's like Batman stuff. Like that's messed up. That's formative. <laughs> he could have become a villain. He could have. Instead, he falls in love with Julie and is going to be her husband or something. Maybe. Maybe. So he has these conversations with his guru and with another guy. And I don't remember the other guy's name, but it felt like the kind of thing that could have been combined in one character. And then he has two boys that come with him on his travels, Indra and Pandu. Poor Pandu. Who who make very little impression except for the fact that Pandu gets bitten by a cobra and dies very quickly. What do we think of Govinda? He's all right. <laughs> I, I mean, I didn't have a, I didn't have problems with him. He, he was tried fine. really hard. Him. Yes, he did. He walked so far. He did walk so far. But did he actually do anything? No. <laughs> I mean, could let me let me ask this question differently. Could the Rack story have been written in third person without an observer? That would be hard because it would just kind of seem like this surrealist. Like, why are we why are we talking about this guy? And we'd be getting a lot of information. Like we got the information a lot because, because Govinda knew a lot of it, like from his like being raised in that culture and like knowing the Mm -hmm. history and stuff. I feel like if it had just info dumped it to us with like a near, like a narrator's like point of view, it wouldn't have, it would have just been really weird to read. It would have felt more like textbooky than this is something I know from my childhood. But that makes Govinda a vehicle. Yes. Yeah. He, I mean, he, 
he kind of is. I think that's why he has his backstory, though, and why he even has that graveyard scene, because I feel like Pike was like, uh, what's the purpose for this guy? And he's right. one of the few that actually got something else. Right. That's true. At and- the same time, I feel like there didn't need to be a religious lore behind the cold one itself. Or mm-hmm. this big bat. Like, I, I honestly don't think it needed to have this, like, this such a complex reason that this that this happened. It's like, hey, this this woman was going into a coma as as, you know, she was conceiving and, you know, that there she's just kind of on the border of life and death. And that 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 I, feel like that, that in. Right, I feel like that would have been enough. Honestly, I, I don't think it needed all so much such a complicated backstory of how this this thing got in the water and all this other stuff. And like, I hate to be that way because I I hate to be like, yeah, let's let's crush the book down. Let's right. But at the same time, I'm just like, I'm just like, I just didn't feel like it needed to be this complicated. But that's the same thing as with the characters. Like, I just didn't feel like it. Like I even wrote it. I, I think like, that's what it is. It, it's just way overcomplicated. Like I don't mind the. I mean, I've I've had a problem with his uh, India diversions in the past, but this one I found strangely interesting. And what I what I think I found most interesting about it was the seeming inevitability of it. Mm. Like. I mean, the the introduction of Rack is for 5,000 years, Rack has lived in a cave in the Himalayas. He has not walked openly in the world since the days of Krishna, but yesterday he left his cage, his cave. And as we speak, he's walking out of the mountains. There's something really, almost it follows about that. Yeah. I, like it, it, it definitely it conjures up imagery. It's, it is strong. It, it's, in, it's, uh, it's intriguing. It's like, I, feel like, I almost feel like that could have been how the whole book started. Yeah. In, instead of starting with characters we will never see again. Right. It's, I mean, not we will never see again. They just aren't right. really <laughs> important, let's be clear. Uh, it's, hmm. I will say this. I like The last episode I listened to was The Grave. Mm-hmm. And so at least this wasn't that. <laughs> Fair. Because like, I was like that, like I was listening. I was like, this is so racist. Yeah. So at least it was yeah. like these are characters trying to stop the problem in some regards. Although the ending makes it. Wait a second. Maybe not. I think it's you're honestly right, so confusing Cassie, that too, the, the sequel is almost essential. Yeah, like, I feel like we needed the sequel, but, like, with this, the whole book, they make it seem like Rack's, like, a bad guy. Like, he got blinded and, like, all this bad stuff happens, but he's only coming out to stop this bad thing. And it's, like, the whole time he's, like, why anything? It doesn't really matter either way. Who gives a shit, you know? But then he's, you walked all this way. You, like, came out of your cave after 5,000. Obviously, something matters. So, like... It just it, his actions seemed to go against what he was saying too, which is really Did weird. Did Rack put Kali in Julie? I think Peter did. Peter did. Yeah, Peter yeah. did because he was partially like still a lot. Like he wasn't fully cold like the other one. He was cool. <laughs> they made a point. He was cool, <laughs> not cold. Um, and so yeah, I think he got her pregnant when they did it three and she. Well, yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah, because because they were concerned. It's like, oh crap, we is she is she pregnant? And it's like, and then Rock is is talking about all this stuff with, you know, with the stuff when when Julie comes back alive later, and it's just like, yeah, I'm pretty well, sure. Well, no, so Peter made her pregnant. Yes, just like Doctor Lawrence Morey made Sandra pregnant. But was that baby Kali at conception? Or was that that fetus turned into Kali after Julie was drowned by the cold one? I think she are, it, it already was. There was something about his semen, like his, the baby he would make. And that's mm-hmm. why Sarah wanted him to do it with her. Because she was like, yours is the only one that will like, oh. live inside of me. Because that's the why baby Lisa was partially Con- cold. Lisa Contrell, his ex, was talking about how like 
you know, she had had a miscarriage from, from him and then that she didn't want to be around him anymore because she was like, yeah, there's just right. something wrong with you. Okay, I get it. But So what happens too is that at the end when – the Sarah changes Julie. So while Julie's in the water, exactly as Sandra was like when she's probably like, she could be becoming pregnant or something. If she's not already pregnant by then, like it could have happened then, but I don't think it had anything to do with what the guy like rock did to her later. That was just to get the cold stuff out of her, like to save her from what Sarah did to her. To stop her okay, becoming so, one of the cold ones. Bastards. Yeah. 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 Rack just sort of made her normal again. Yes. yes. Now she's I don't just think he could have done anything for the baby. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. And maybe that is what it is too, because he, so maybe that was his purpose then because he, the baby needs to be born and he knew that, that Sarah was going to kill her in the water there. So his whole purpose was coming there because he waited. He didn't do anything until Julie was in the water with Sarah. Then he walked forward. Then he like started interacting with them. Well, more so Sarah, because he had already interacted with Julie. So I feel like that was his entire purpose now that I'm questioning it. Like he came all this way, left the cave, did all this so that the baby could be born to that woman. And so he could save her so the baby could live. And that makes sense that he's portrayed as the villain because ostensibly he ensures the destruction of the world or whatever Later. Kali right. is going to do. Exactly. In the second book that we never got. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which it's funny because the back of the book says that Sarah implies that Sarah's the one who's going to do that. But she didn't like she she didn't seem to get that in her head. I'm not really sure what her motivation was, honestly, because like she starts um, making more of her bastards and then she's like, OK, I want you to go out and kill. And then that's as that's as good a plan as she gets until after she finds out that that Dr. Murray is her father. And then she's like yeah we should destroy the world and that's when that seems to be when she's like with peter and like did, did she have this plan before with peter because he would have totally he would have totally had sex with her earlier but now it's too late yeah it would have been much easier plan. before before everything was revealed right she didn't want to do any of that stuff until so what happened when the power went out in the in iowa and then the mother had like that weird blip and then uh, the life the living life put into her when that living life was put into her it interrupted their link so that's why she couldn't hear the voice anymore because the mother oh was like God. it was right. broken the bond between now. them somehow yeah so she still had like her memories because she is her but at the same time like the voice was gone and so that's when she was like the voice is gone i don't have a purpose i'm not like everybody else and i don't know why i'm gonna fucking burn it all down like mm -hmm. so i understood that motivation of being just like uh i'm confused and don't know what's happening kill everything <laughs> like that, okay. for me it was that was very understandable so but, sarah was relatable then yeah. yeah at least just in a certain bit okay like it's to a certain because when you get like when you're overwhelmed and you don't understand, you don't have answers and you know you're different, you're just like, fine. Like, like as a kid, there were – even now, there are plenty of times where I'm just like, I am not good with people. I do not understand how friends are supposed to work. Fuck this. I'm not talking to anybody anymore. Like, I don't like this. I don't like it. And so I could understand her being like, why am I different? Why do I exist? Where did the voice go? I don't care anymore. Fuck it. Like, let's just <laughs> and and look at what I can do. Yeah, because yeah. she said I started to exert my will like for the first time, like on purpose. And I, I, she says she doesn't know where it comes from or why, but she's like, why not? <laughs> like, let's just do it then. Mm -hmm. And I think she's trying to make more people that are like her because she doesn't want to be alone. And that's why she wants her brother to impregnate her. That's why she tries to create <laughs> the offspring, like the the Ralph or Chuck or you know all those little ones. And then she's like, well, they couldn't <laughs> they couldn't become like me because they they weren't the same like they right. were about their formation was different she was completely dead at the time of like making them so it's just it's weird it's really weird <laughs> it is <It's, laughs> okay that makes sense it's told in such a corkscrew manner in the book though mm -hmm. but i appreciate yes. you putting that together cassie <laughs> <laughs> okay so we are going to talk more about sarah the cold one later Let's talk about Sarah Moray, the character, <laughs> first. And it, I can't explain why, but she's played by Isabella Rossellini in my mind. I don't know who that is. From Blue Velvet. Okay, I do know who that is. I don't picture her that way. I, I, again, I can't explain why. <laughs> but that's just who she was the entire time for some reason. It's 
what, what I find very interesting now that I've finished the book, and I don't know that it's interesting, good or interesting, bad, is the uh, facade of Sarah Moray on top of the inner thoughts of the cold one. Because Sarah Moray is, is an engaged person, uh, a painter, um, who is good with conversation, who's good with, uh, getting people to like her seemingly by being a good, nice person, not necessarily by using this power. And at the same time, her conversations with people she's not interested in as the cold one are very different. Did that dichotomy work for you too? I feel like the, the nicer, like it, so it was the cold one the whole time, but there was a part of her that was her mother still. So she was just, she was voicing and talking and doing everything that her mother would have done. Oh, okay. So it was just like, that was Sandra that was still living through her. And that's why the cold one was there the whole time, but the voice is Sandra. So that's the part of her that's like reacting the way she thinks she should, because it's the way that she did as Sandra, but Hmm. the cold one's in there. So it doesn't have the feeling. It doesn't have empathy. It doesn't, it doesn't have the why she's doing this. It just has the voice, which is just these memories that have been transferred over. Gotcha. And that felt, and that felt weird to me because like Mm -hmm. again when you're in peter's point of view and he meets sarah at the museum like she's so like outgoing feeling Mm -hmm. and what is what's the thing she says uh i make my living being beautiful i think she says when he's at the house yeah it's just you go to the cold one parts and they talk about it talks about like pretending at this pretending at that and i'm like this sounds like that's again the problematic stuff but it's like it sounds like like description of masking yeah it does the whole time it does Mm -hmm. and i don't know if that's i'm not sure i like that either (laughs) no i think i think it's strange but i like i picked up on that when i was reading and i don't think i did when i was little but i was like in the chapters especially too where it was talking about how like the voice tells her to react a certain way and she doesn't know why she's supposed to do it, but she just knows she should. I was like, that feels a lot like being autistic in social situations where I know I'm supposed to react a certain way, but I don't understand why. But like, I've learned to do it. It's like ingrained from like years of customer service and years of being around people who do this. Like, and there, there is, there, there are a lot of things that people do. And I'm just like, I don't understand why that happened, but ah, yeah, cool. (laughs) Great. (laughs) And I just like smile and nod. So I, I did pick up, I I didn't bother me because I don't think he was intentionally trying to make commentary on that, but it did like, and that's why I was just like, I don't know if I'm going to bring that up on the episode. Cause I don't know if I'm the only person who like felt that way, or if that's just like a weird, like, look at me, I'm autistic. Here's the thing I saw. (laughs) No, I, that's what jumped out to me. Right. When they were describing that, like, and that, and with the bastards too, is like, oh, they don't, they don't, feel things anymore but they can pretend and i'm just like they don't they they pretend extensively because like when when chuck calls peter at the beginning um you know that that feels like i don't know typical like cat and mouse serial killer stuff right exactly yeah Yeah. like he's manipulating him it's really interesting and uh, having you both mention the masking thing I had not considered that at all, uh, that the the parallels there. I think it's shitty to have those parallels, especially like from my perspective where I see a lot of stuff that I'm like, oh, I relate to that. And it's always the bad guy. And I'm like, because <laughs> like people, my whole life people are like, oh, wow, you're really cold. Like, I'm not like, I just don't often react in the way people expect a person will. So it can seem like it. He definitely <laughs> like... like- he definitely does like, and this seems like a, every book he he has that like hearing about something and then throwing it in. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, because because like like I don't know where I read this at this point before I read the book, and I shouldn't have read, looked at anything, but I was talking about like all these two serial killers: one who kills people in a normal way, and one who kills people in a supernatural way, and. It might have been Goodreads, but I was just like, was was that 
was that one of those situations where he sent it into the editor first before he wrote the book but like mm -hmm. at the same time just like i wonder if chuck because he seems like a pantser so so i'm wondering yeah. if when he started with chuck that he didn't really have the other side of it planned out and then he heard, could have heard about that stuff and be like oh okay this is this is how this villain is this yeah who knows and chuck is also real right yeah because that's Just necessary <laughs> Like it would have mattered at all if Chuck was Ralph on the phone, right? Because it's not even like because because when when he talks to Peter later, Peter's like, "Hey, you weren't there," and Chuck is like, "Oh, I was kind of there." And then later you find out, "Oh, it was because Sarah was there." Right. Okay, the last character we're going to talk about is Susan Darley. We've already talked about her a little. Jerry Washington's girlfriend, who very very quickly becomes something else. There's just some interesting things with her, and that's why I wanted to mention her as uh, her own character. First of all, Jerry's description of her <laughs> is rough. She was only 17 and still in high school, but he wasn't worried about being arrested for statutory rape. For <clears> once <throat> in his life, he was having fun. Gross. The proximity yep. of those two sentences is very disturbing to me. I think, yeah, and it should be like as it should be that it's it says exactly what it says. It's gross. Yeah. <laughs> Ew. It's interesting. I I forgot about that. It's but I had this note from when she she kills Jerry later that she she asks she says to him twice that she's gonna like go down on him, and he keeps mm -hmm. saying no, and she does it anyway. Mm -hmm. I don't have a point to that. I'm just like noting the juxtaposition between those two. Yeah. I was like, hey, hey, Jerry, maybe you should have been worried about it. I don't know. It's yes, a, if yeah. he had worried about statutory rape, he wouldn't have gotten uh, torn apart. Which is which is the, where the rest of my quotes uh, <laughs> from Susan Darley come from, because that scene between her and Jerry at the end of Jerry's life is absolutely amazing oh yeah it is yeah that's one of my that's it's a good quote scene yeah uh what tore him apart hands whose hands i don't know it doesn't matter <laughs> where are your parents he whispered dead how did they die she took a step toward him screaming i love that one <laughs> i love Me that too. so much that's my favorite <laughs> it, it's so great and then i'll make you happy before i make you sad she promised she lowered her head. It was a promise she didn't keep. He was screaming even before her gentle turn to rough. That is horrifying. It like, is. How it is did so I read this when good. I was like 13, 14? Like, what the heck? I mean, that, honestly, that kind of stuff in this book, there are, there are things that I'm willing to overlook a lot of shit because they're so good. Honestly, I felt she was a more compelling antagonist than Sarah because we get to see her beforehand. Mm -hmm. It was just she she actually had an arc to that. I mean, uh, she apparent so did Sarah apparently cuz like after Cassie explained it to me. Um but but, <laughs> but but Sandra had one that was very apparent with it in or Susan, I'm sorry. Oh my god, all yeah. these S names. Yeah. Um, no, Susan had a very clear you know, catalyst is like, okay, so she, she, you know, drowned, she was revived. And it seems, again, it seems like the NDE, like, Hey, something else came back instead of, instead of right. Susan. And it turns out, you know, the person who resuscitated her was Sarah, but like, it was just, I like, that was so jarring in a good way. The, the, the difference, like in the way that Jerry is looking for help is like, Hey, this, like, she's different. She's changed. And that she like tore this other guy apart. Mm -hmm. who he got arrested for of course well yes of course i think it's they, weird. they did let him out quickly. they did they did they let him out really quickly but so she like sarah kills her for no reason she just sees this girl in the ocean with her boyfriend she like is in the water she grabs her holds her underwater and like murders her and then breathes her breath into her to change her like just a girl at the beach for no reason just i why why and she seems to be spreading she she's been she's trying to grab others to become her like cold one bastards 
doesn't it seem like it would make more sense to grab people who are alone or like not in the middle of an activity with somebody else? Like it's just the choice of it was just, and there were, they talk about how there's like a bunch of people at the beach too. I don't know. That, that kind of, that's, I like that because that just means she doesn't care. Yeah. Like literally she could not care less about the people people around. Yeah. And that's, that's scary to me. Right. Because it, the... it doesn't matter, you, you know, if you're in a whole group of people, she can walk right up to you and s- just eat your face. Or hold you underwater. I think the visual of, like, a woman coming from under the waves. Yeah, from and, like, below. Yeah. 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 That, like, that is so creepy to me. When I was reading this, I was like, oh, my God. Like, that is terrifying. I also And like... not only that, but then that woman being on the beach giving you mouth-to-mouth yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because he probably just carries her out of the water and yeah. like, oh, I found this body. Right. <laughs> I just found yeah. this body. <laughs> I love it. It's very upsetting. I liked um, also, I liked Jerry's franticness trying to find her up and down the beach felt very real. It yeah. did. It did. Which it's makes like, me wonder, just... you know, in all of Pike's uh, scuba diving and everything, has he almost lost someone? Because mm. there that stuff... That is a reoccurring imagery in in these books, and I wonder if that's direct. You know, I don't know if it, like I. So I don't know. I I can't answer that obviously definitively, but I feel like if I knew somebody who personally and I was personally affected by somebody drowning, I wouldn't make that the cause of death in like eighty percent of my books. <laughs> but I would just wouldn't want to relive that while writing so much. Like mm. it, and it's so often like die softly, right? Like. Mm-hmm. No, bury me deep, bury me deep. That's the one. And then like it's just the one of the the pirate ship or something, and they're in the water and pretends that they're dead, and then the one guy does drown. Like there's so much yeah, drowning fall, in these uh, books. Uh, oh, fall into darkness. That fall into too. darkness. Yeah. Yeah. So we're gonna take a quick break, and then we'll be right back with remember me and our plot discussion. So we'll be right back on the Pikecast. Friends, where else can you get this kind of programming than the Pikecast? Nowhere, that's where. But we're trying to keep the lights on here. If you like what you're hearing and want it to keep happening, jump over to our Patreon at thepikecast.com slash Patreon and throw us a few bucks to join our private Discord server. Higher tiers get books, stickers, bookmarks, and even personalized shirts. That's thepikecast.com slash Patreon. Once, Osgood and Frost were the up-and-coming stars of the burgeoning paranormal investigation TV show craze before a hoax put an end to their friendship, partnership, and television careers. Now, over a decade later, Prudence Osgood is a barely functioning alcoholic ghost hunter for hire. Her yearning for mystery and adventure is reignited when she receives a cryptic, untraceable email. She can't resist embarking on an investigation that tugs threads, winding through a sinister series of disappearances, her former partner's family, and a night 20 years ago when a semi blew a yellow light and nearly killed her. Reviewers are calling Osgood as Gone a masterfully vulnerable and relatable 21st century horror story and a bourbon-soaked supernatural mystery with sparkling dialogue that sticks the landing on LGBT characters and main character Prudence Osgood, as tortured as she is clever, broken in all the best ways, and a true heroine for our times. Buy it today at As Good As Gone as a paperback, ebook, or audiobook narrated by me, J.J. Ronvier. Welcome back to the podcast. Now we're diving into Remember Me, which is our plot discussion. And as we always mention, we've already done a lot of plot discussion. But there is a lot of plot in this book. So let's get to it. Uh, I... <laughs> don't know where these belong i have two quotes from the big uh gangland um shootout destruction (laughs) thing at the beginning and they're just so 
bizarre. I mean, first of all, because the fucking guy's name is Fist. <laughs> so Fist thought Jerry and a couple of stooges from the low ranks would be perfect to put a little red in clear gel's genital shampoo. <laughs> I, I don't know. I had that one written down. <laughs> oh my god. I don't know. I've never <laughs> ever heard anything like that. <laughs> and I'm very curious as our, if our listeners have. Is put a little red in genital shampoo a thing? What is genital I'm, shampoo? I'm, there is nothing. <laughs> I'm a little concerned what Christopher Pike thinks shampoo is for. <laughs> Does he, does he think there's like special shampoo? There's special for shampoo. Like <laughs> well, there is if you have uh, if you have. Uh, that's not like an crabs. everyday use, though. That's not like. No, no, that's true. I just picture he goes to Walmart and he's like, "Where's the genital <laughs> shampoo section? I, I, I found all the regular shampoo, but where's the genital shampoo?" I mean, honestly, it makes me remember, like, literally one of the, my favorite lines that Jack Nicholson has ever had from As Good As It Gets, where he says, people who talk in metaphors ought to shampoo my crotch. <laughs> Is, what does it mean? It does, I don't know. I guess it would be very demeaning to be told to shampoo someone's crotch. I, I mean, unless you're into it, then I guess maybe. I don't know. Or someone. <laughs> there might, I'm sure there's people out there. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's the other one from that. These days, he was doing all his business with Mother Goose in hand. Jell's affectionate nickname for his double-barreled shotgun. <laughs> what gangland, <laughs> like, high-ranking gangland figure is calling his shotgun Mother Goose? She's laying all those eggs, Cooper. <laughs> I thought it was because of her fables. And, <laughs> okay, can I read one from that section? Yes, please. Yes. Crashing into bodies, jumping through dust, shooting people, stuff of bad movies, daily occurrence in the projects. Oh, I, yeah. And I was just like, really? really? See, all I know about the barrio I learned from Christopher Pike. God. It's, oh. Is the barrio an offensive term? I don't know anymore. It feels I like after either. Pikes used it. <laughs> yeah, it feels dirty now that Pikes used See, it. And, and <laughs> I laugh every time Barrio comes up because of Dwight on The Office, where he asks about Sesame Street. Is that the show with all the puppets living in the Barrio? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's it's oh, it's so, so perfect. Stupid. So stupid. <laughs> <laughs> okay let's move on so uh one of the characters i omitted from our character list is preacher craig westmore oh yes my scene <laughs> <laughs> rim cage scene i've carried that with me my whole like i've been saving this for this episode can i tell you i have asked at least three of my ex-boyfriends while we've been in bed after sex <laughs> What do you? What would you do if I ripped out your ribs one by one and like broke them? And they've all been like, "What the fuck is wrong with you?" And I'm like, "I read it in a book once. I was just wondering like what your reaction would be because in the book the reaction didn't go as I thought it would have." And so I'm just curious. And it's because of this. I didn't remember what book it was. I knew it was a Pike thing, but I'm so glad. I'm well, I'll so tell you, glad. Cassie, if you're trying not to sound like the bad guy in this book. I mean, I've started Asking to embrace people it. people about the ribcage, that's, that's a... It's not like, it's just, it's just a curious, like a hypothetical. Like, no, I, if I were to dig my Cassie, fingers Cassie, into your stomach and I've known rip you for a while now. I know you're not actually going to rip someone's ribcage off. No, I don't think I have the physical strength. <laughs> <laughs> that's all that's stopping you. That is literally all that stands between Cassie <laughs> and ripping out ribs one by one is the lack of a bit of strength to do it. Just, just, you're just going to sit there. It's like, do you not want to be part of my Christopher Pike LARPing? Like what? <laughs> this could be fun for us. <laughs> like, I don't get it. Like Rich tells me all the time. He's like, you're so close to a super villain. Like it's a really good thing. You don't have like 
super strength or like <laughs> powers of some sort. <laughs> He's like, I don't think you'd be on the side of good. And I'm like, what do you mean? Of course Why? I would. <laughs> Cassie, I, I just need to reemphasize how much I love you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm glad to have found people who appreciate my. We have a kinship. <laughs> Not that I want to rip people's ribs out. I just I don't say I want to. I'm just curious about it. Because can you like just? It's so visceral. Just imagine holding one in your hand and then like pulling it upwards so hard that it snaps in your hand and you can feel it. Like no, I I've thought I, about this a lot. Here, this book. let me let me make you feel less. Uh... Uh, out there, Cassie. <laughs> I I also occasionally wonder if I'm a sociopath because I do have that man. That baby's head is so small, like it's a, in my hand. They're like, called intrusive thoughts. What yeah. would happen if I squeezed it? Yeah, you're just like it just popped. Yeah, like, I don't want to do it. No, I don't. But what would anybody. happen? No, I get yeah. it. So now we're both sociopaths and psychopaths. <laughs> So I'm I'm there with you, Cassie. Is what I'm, just I'm saying. Ripping out the ribs of my boyfriends, you're popping heads on babies. Yeah. And Haley's wishing and she like, was on a different like, podcast. Yeah, she's like, oh my fucking god! I'm thinking. The thought in my head right now is that I did not give the Starlight Crystal enough pikes. <laughs> well, you, I suppose we could revise if you want. <laughs> After reading this, I was like, I should have given it four. <laughs> <laughs> I love that both books you've been here for. I'm like, this was my favorite when I was little. I'm so excited. <laughs> I, I, okay, again, I thoroughly enjoyed reading The Starlight Crystal. It's just one of those books that the moment you start to talk or think about it, it completely <laughs> folds in on itself and becomes a black hole. Yeah, yep. I mean, I, honestly, this one is much easier to talk about. It, it than is the like Crystal was. Oh, we didn't. Oh, we 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 aren't breaking our brains talking about this one. I just like this one. I just like I didn't. I didn't enjoy it. Just to be just to be frank, I I did not enjoy reading. I was kind of like there was a lot of sighing and a lot of jotting things down. And there there occasionally there were parts of, where I was just like, oh, okay, that was neat. And then we're back to because okay, because if we're talking plot, Peter. A lot of this book is somebody, something happens and somebody had people have a conversation about it. And then mm -hmm. you have another scene where another character has to be told about the thing happening and the conversation about it. And then the right. next scene has to be telling about that conversation and so on and so forth. It's just very repetitious. That's, that's very true. And then it feels artificially inflated because of that. There were definitely times when I felt like this didn't need to be a 350 page book. It felt like a book you're supposed to read a couple chapters a week, like a soap opera kind of thing. And then mm -hmm. you need the refresher about stuff. Whereas like, I do think that if it had been a 200 page book, this would have been, it would have been much better. And like, the, but the, like some of the stuff that he does in the YA books, that is like, it's charming in its audacity. Yeah. In this, in an adult book ends up, the opposite it ends up feeling more juvenile when this is an interesting thought so if 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 we were to adapt this and we were to adapt it let's say as an eight episode tv show and we could really really flesh out these other storylines and make them intersect with the main storyline far more and would that be a better would that would that be good or would it be adapted into a a hundred minute horror movie and cut all the fat? Which way would you go? The second one, definitely. Yeah. Like hands. I would down. do the first. Oh, I would do my the God. <laughs> Yeah, because I feel like each one like okay, because then picture it though, you could have a whole episode for just the beginning where all that like fighting and explosive stuff was happening and it'd oh, be like when you said it would just have the its beginning, own vibe. with the nurse. No, 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 no. That, so that's another thing. Like, so we could start with that and then go into like the exploding stuff, which is just like such different vibes. And then the next episode is like, we're in India. Like, what the fuck is happening in this show? It would feel like American Horror Story or something, especially like uh, season two, Asylum, where they had like Anne Frank and then suddenly there were aliens. And then yeah. suddenly, like, it was just all over the place. Chaos. I love it. Like, 
I would have, I would have, okay. I would eat this up okay. as a show. I'm so sorry. If you, if you, okay. If you adapted it, maybe I'm, I was thinking more like, cause okay. Cause Mike Flanagan is doing the, the midnight club and the yeah. pikes up. And it sounds like he's doing a similar anthology type of thing with, uh, how, follow the house of usher. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what that would mean for the cold one. Cause I, I think you'd have a hard time fitting this whole story into one episode of anything, but, um, right. I mean, if you did it like that, then yeah. Cause like, honestly, I, I feel like the way you'd have to go is either you follow Peter and the cops and Julie and you cut out some of the India stuff and the gang stuff, or you cut out Julie and Peter and you focus on the gang stuff and the India stuff. Cause I feel like either of those would have made a more interesting book than splashing it all together and just having endless rep- repetitious conversations about those things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, I feel like there's a lot you could do to make this, a slicker book, a, an interest, like, I don't know, I'm trying to bang on it too well, much, honestly. No, it's, it's also worth noting the, where this comes in his canon. So this is 95. It's still somewhat early. I mean, like he, he's pumped out all these teen books here. And it it is worth noting as writers how it can feel like, oh, but how did they learn about that? Well, I have to have someone tell them about it. You know? And it's something that you lose with maturity as a writer because you realize the the readers can come along without having their hand held. Yeah. So that that may be it too. Yeah, that's true too. I know. Who I know a lot this? of our, our stuff here with Pike is about, uh, you know, trying to figure out his meaning, his his uh, his thought process, and it's it's not necessarily the most uh, effective way to analyze a book. No, I and and again, I don't like to I don't like to rag on things. I just like I I think I think this book just frustrated me because it felt like it was it felt like. It felt like it was taking a long walk down a short road. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, oh, that's for really... sure on that. And it also uh, to like, to me, you know, I've talked about this stuff in the past, obviously when, when we get sidetracked with a long explanation and we do in this, we, mm-hmm. we go uh, through, you know, 6,000 years of uh, his Hindu history here. And we talk about, uh, you know, abilities and we learn about the chakras and there, I mean, it's literally a character who knows about the chakras talking to a character who also knows about the chakras to tell the audience about the chakras. Yeah. And there are definitely moments that feel like that to me, where it's just like, well, why are these two having this conversation? Because they both know it. So clearly it's only to inform me, the reader. And that feels cheap. Uh, like, I don't need to know all this stuff about um, the gods and the abilities. But at the same time, I do want to mention the Pashupastara, which is a weapon... Uh, that instantly vaporized thousands of soldiers. Those who survived the initial blast lost their hair and nails, their mouths bled, and they developed bloody diarrhea, constant vomiting, and skin sores. In short, all the symptoms of severe radiation poisoning. So I read that, and immediately I need to know, okay, well, is Pike talking out of his ass? Or is this a thing? And... It is a thing. It was the most destructive, powerful, irresistible weapon mentioned in the Hindu mythology. And it is a subject of a lot of debate over whether or not there was some kind of nuclear weapon. That is really interesting. Isn't it? Like, you could Um, write a whole fucking book about that. Well, I would have loved to read that one. (laughs) (laughs) 
because I mean, yeah, that and every once in a while, Pike throws something like that in. It's just like, whoa, wait a minute, what? And that's what was partly frustrating. There are so many little diamonds in this book, mm-hmm. and that's just it. Just it's it takes a while to get to them, and then it, there's a long stretches between them. There there are neat bits, and I I was getting more engaged as we started getting into the reveals of this whole mm-hmm. like messed up family. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. But I do have, I do feel like that was setting up in a sequel, someone would use that weapon. Mm. Oh, yeah. Like it would require the use of that weapon to go up against Kali. Yeah. The Cold and War. And there was a lot of. Cold War. <laughs> <laughs> what a great title. I mean, come I hope on. he goes back to it, and I really hope he gives us a sequel. It, it's it's interesting also because he he felt like he was tying in Hindu mythology to uh, cosmic horror. Yeah, and I don't know if that was intentional, and I don't honestly I don't know about enough about Hindu mythology to know if these tendrils aren't already there. Tendrils about cosmic horror. That was accidental, <laughs> but I love it. Uh, but it it really felt like that the vastness is like because Sarah's painting this uh, warm water, which is weird, yeah, and cold sky, and so it's it's implying something that it's never saying, and I don't know if it's not saying it because Pike wasn't thinking about it. Or if it's not saying it because he was saving it for a sequel. But there's a lot of implication behind the, you know, it's also these these gods are not concerning themselves with mere humans. Right. They're going to do their thing. I feel like, I feel like the book, it, like when you guys talk about some of this stuff, I feel like the book is kind of purposely avoiding a lot of interesting things Mm -hmm. to then focus on not so interesting things like like uh you know peter loving one woman that he met on one day Mm -hmm. more than the other woman he met on one day things like that and also her julie loving peter because that was just so sad to watch yeah yeah it it really was it was like like pathetic sad like when when the guy's like oh are you guys getting married and she's like not today she said sadly like yeah. you've known each other for a week like you had sex like twice like calm down and here it is but he could see julie loved him already she fell fast but he did too he already loved sarah even though he didn't think the infatuation healthy it's like oh come on thirsty people come on I feel like that one so his with sarah was i think he was just like confused and he had some sort of like connection to her because they were twins sure. and, I no, and I, yeah that for love but the other once girl we had learned no that yeah yeah, yeah a lot fair. made more sense but until but we time, learned that it was just yeah. like oh jesus like gross <laughs> Wait, he's immediately yeah. like he's immediately like oh this this woman at this museum who i am suddenly wild about yeah exactly and oh and this part like when he's on the phone with Amos at one point and Amos is like, I'm warning you, don't fuck with him. Talking about Dr. Moore. He's like, Peter's like, it's his wife I want to fuck. Yeah, right. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know what to do with that. So I, I do want to I do want to talk a little bit about the actual mythology of the cold one. And that Rack was born because a whole bunch of kids went to play in a lake and he went too deep and one of his friends was fucking with him and and accidentally killed him, sort of? Yeah. And then something came inside him. Wait, was that him? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize that was... Well, it's the story he tells... Um... Dr. Moray. I don't think that was about himself, though. 
Yeah. I, I, that's what I assumed. It that's was what I him. took too. It was such a weird scene because Dr. Moray, who's irritated with everyone who crosses his path, is like, oh yeah, come in, it's fine. Like he was almost amused that this guy wanted to talk to him. Well, also, Rack has the same sort of mind control. Like, oh, we're going right. to talk, you know, so enjoy it. <laughs> but I'm confused, though, because so he, when did he, when, because it, so he, his mom got raped, and so he was born, and then his dad took him away from the village, and then he grew up and murdered his dad. When did he go to the lake? That's a good question. Maybe it wasn't about Rack. Maybe, Maybe it was, it was about just Dr. a metaphor Moore. about, yeah, Sandra. But what may, it might have been about Dr. Moray, possibly, because he had to do impregnate Sandra. I don't know. The mythology gets weird. It does. Because they it don't specify. It's like the boy and the place yeah. and the thing. Yeah. It's like it's not very concrete. No. Cause, so when I read it, I thought he was just like telling him like a story about like the cold one. It Like the very first person who became a cold one because mm. it's implied that there were others. Mm -hmm. But I don't think – He's a cold one. No, I don't they, think he is. He but he touches people. Like, they say it's warm and soft, like his touch. But he has right. the power to take it out. Ugh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so he's like the, the anti-cold one, but well, he's maybe, also not Maybe what good. it's saying is that the cold one is is only able to come in with dead breath. So he was just telling a story about a boy who became like a cold one. And that was the like he was just telling as an unrelated story. Like, this is what happens. You should be on the lookout for anybody. Well, who no, and, cold. and also, hey, remember when you tried to kill your wife? Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah, yeah. she almost okay. drowned. Oh, you should right. think about that. Yeah, right, right. Because it, it is the, um, you know, the mystical religious characters talking in metaphors and parables to get you to realize what you're supposed to realize. Oh, so there could have not even been a boy to begin with. Like yeah, he it could... may not be a real story. It's okay. just a, hey, this stuff happens, and did you ever think it may have happened to you? Yeah, that makes sense. It is a messed up story, though, because that's like, that's the kind of story, because like, kids are mean, and you can imagine kids, mm -hmm. like, a tragedy occurring like that. And so I didn't remember that part of the story at all from when I was little. And so when I read it this time, I was like, that's so sad. That poor little boy. Yeah. like. Dang. <laughs> okay. Okay. And it also now. it also ties into Christopher Pike's obsession with scuba diving malfunctions. It does. Yes. Yeah. There was. Yeah. There was before even scuba diving was a thing. They're just like, yeah, he grabbed this reed and was breathing through it. Like, yeah. Look at you, Pike. Always putting your little your little things inside <laughs> here. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go to the mall for the other action scene in the book. Um. I was so I'm always uh I'm always thrown off by two things in Pike books that people are able to fly anywhere very quickly <laughs> like hey there's a there's a plane leaving for America from India in 30 minutes I'll get on it because this is pre 911 and People with guns shooting up big, vast areas because, you know, obviously that's a, that's a thing these days. Um, but like Monster, Pike's people with guns shooting up vast areas is really visceral and intense. So I'm not going to say I liked it. <laughs> But the mall scene was probably one of the best scenes in the book. I like the part before the guns, though, where they talked about how, like, the six people just walked into the food court or whatever and just, and started, just started ripping, ripping people apart. People. Yeah. Right. yeah, like, yeah. that was cool. When they brought out the guns, I was a little less, like, yeah, I was like, ah, ah, cool. Okay, guns, I guess. You're just blowing each other up. But the, the physical violence is cooler. Because that was the thing. It was just, like, anybody could do that. Like sure. the old ones yeah. ripping people apart with their bare. That was the thing that, like, one of the things I rolled my eyes at because they were talking about when um, Ted uh, was dead, and like Amos is like he must have been ripped to shreds by an extremely strong man. It's like because that happens, um, <laughs> right? But right. when they actually start doing that, and Amos has to deal with that situation when he's with the other cops responding to the to the mall situation, it's just like oh crap. But then yeah, they bring out the guns, and it's like. I get that this is more efficient, but it's not, it's not 
as compelling and it's True. not as tact like tactile that like like the fact that they're they were doing that is just like that's something that would like what's the word i don't know like i i could see like that being like just more traumatic mm-hmm. to, to to witness yeah. but but no it was still it was still an engaging scene though um, and the crawling through the vent to yeah. get into the sporting goods store and uh I mean, like, and I, I really enjoyed the um, descriptions of what Susan was doing. Like, she almost seemed to be turned into an animal. Yeah. Like, leaping around and then crouching. And it, it was, but I agree with you. It would have been far more interesting if their damage had been done simply by being really fast and really strong. I liked that at the end of the sequence where. I forget who, I don't know if it was Blank or someone else was getting on Amos's case about like, you know, you can't just unload into somebody like that. And he was like, that's how much it took to take her down. Right. Like that was like, oh, that was, that was unnerving. Yeah. I think they did have like a couple of moments in that whole scene though that like took me out. Like in that part, he was like, do you remember Rodney King? And yeah, it was right. just like, wait. Oh, I forgot that. <laughs> Yeah, and that, like, I, I stopped for a second was like what like it would just took me out of the story and then there was right before that when he right before he like it, fights with her he like it's like he took his shoes and socks off and i was like what like i get he's trying to be sneaky i understand but like hard. the time i it was just so the time <laughs> it takes to take your shoes and socks off first of all and that's not quiet like you're rustling they're like superhuman by this point like yeah, and and taking <laughs> your socks off does not make you any quieter no than you could have just kept the socks yeah. on that's that's another thing and i just and so i'm just and like i don't like the like the visual of just his moist little feet <laughs> on so i was just like immediately grossed out because i was like you, you could have kept your socks on like that's disgusting i don't like it i was just immediately pulled out of that scene because of the feet and then the the weird part at the end of it where he's like remember this <laughs> police brutality and i was just like hang on <laughs> like the the most action-packed scene after the beginning one and it's like i was like hang on here i don't like these things <laughs> more arms getting ripped off less of this other stuff um, yeah yeah what's <laughs> grossing me out is 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 the uh moist little sweaty piggies on the it's floor gross because he's he's been running and worked up so they're moist in his shoes and then he's got to peel off the ugh, i just don't like it wow. i don't like it's that 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 if he, it could have been he could have been walking through milk and that would is the only thing that would have made it worse for me honestly like if, if there had been milk involved in some way is the only thing that would have made it good worse. god yeah i'm very specific about the things i don't like no, very, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, getting pulled out of books by the weirdest shit yeah well let's let's move on to some of the weirdest stuff i've i've read here um, oh yeah, which is <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is when uh, so so uh, the cold one turns Julie's ex Stan into a cold one after trying to do that with the lawyer who's randomly there, Dell. Dell. <laughs> I forgot and, about Stan and Dell. <laughs> and there's that, yeah. But you know, as as much fun as that scene with the the three of them are, I want to talk about when Stan. Okay, so it's awful that he's trying to rape her. Right. Awful. But what's really awful here is that Stan released her ankles and began to unzip his pants and reveal an erection the color of a slab. Of E. coli salami. <laughs> nice detail, Pike. Thank you for that. Yes. We really needed that, and I appreciate it. <laughs> then God. his big dick waved at her as he went down just as Mick Jagger yelled for his brown sugar. <laughs> then, this is the best one. You ready? His still smiling, dirty penis. <laughs> Took the brunt of the blow. This is from the aquarium. As it shattered, the glass stripped the organ of its skin. <laughs> and there we go. I don't even feel bad for Stan. He was a shitty oh, guy. No. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. It, it, 
It was just bizarre, bizarre <laughs> genital descriptions. There. That's some like weird Final Destination <laughs> shit. Like, yeah, you remember that time my aquarium fell over? It stripped my entire dick. Like, yeah, what? I how mean, did I'm, that I'm even? I'm sitting there trying to figure out how the aquarium could have possibly shattered. Well, because his dick was so big and hard and salami And salami-like, yeah. It, it broke the glass on impact, <laughs> as you do, obviously. Oh, so you're saying the aquarium shattered when it hit his dick, yes. not him. Yes, yes, yes. No, yeah. It, it Like, he... It, obviously, he would have hit it dick first, because that's the pointed part out of his Yeah, body. absolutely. So it, you're like, right, landed right. on that him was, and then that shattered. That was a few inches above the rest of his body. Yeah, it's like it's like if you, like, punch through a glass window, your skin would be, sh- like, shaved from your fist, I guess. <laughs> like, it's like that, but dick. Yeah, so it's, <laughs> it's like the Mike Flanagan degloving, but dick. Yes. D, yes. Yes. Oh, it's, it, it, it's a really <laughs> gory, like, serious thing to happen that because we've been reading so many of his, like, YA books in which this would never Oh, yes, exactly. Oh, no. <laughs> It's so what because I forget for a while. Like I forget we're in his adult book, and then stuff like this, and I'm like, oh, what? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh no. It's it's like you know in his in his kids' book, he definitely wants to do some genital trauma. God, <sighs> I I'm glad they don't let him because this would be a lot in every book. I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Moving on. Unless you more thoughts about the dick trauma no i shared all my thoughts on the dick trauma okay okay um let's talk about rack raising govinda's wife vani from the grave to give birth to a dead child for no reason that was messed up it's it's for closure it's for closure it was for a reason he would never so he even like he would not have been able to even move on with julie or anything because he would have been forever stuck in that rut and he even says like how he was disconnected from his culture and the way he was raised because he was so angry so when he finally like because it was unfinished he never got to see his child he never got to like say goodbye or anything so then she just gets shot trying to buy milk so now he's like this is horrifying and they make it out like it's really bad and terrifying but it's actually like a good thing for him i think because he's grateful at the end and it's he's able to move on and he's able to burn her as he should have before which he should <laughs> customarily okay. he should he shouldn't bear so i'll her. agree with you that's what pike said it was about <laughs> But let's also really talk about this. <laughs> His dead wife mm-hmm. punches her way out of a coffin. Yeah. This spreads first. her legs. Drops she's under the sorry. Baby. She's not like she was it wasn't like a vulgar display. I mean, well, it it was, but not like for, more for, so. For a corpse. For a corpse to give birth, but like she did it like modestly. No, I think. I'm not saying no. I'm not saying vulgar in any way other than against nature. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then, okay. So I know in Hindu culture, cremation is the thing, but mm-hmm. I doubt it's the thing for the husband to light the the reanimated corpse and baby on fire. I don't see any way he is he is over this now, and this is not literally the most traumatic thing he has ever encountered, and he will never be, be able to repress it. I mean, well, so, like, normally they would have, like, a pyre and stuff, but the loved ones would be the ones to with the, the fire, like, lighting it and stuff to, like, say goodbye and, like, while they're doing their prayers and things, so. Sure, but probably not directly lighting the garment that your wife no, is. No, usually they're wrapped in, like, a bunch of, like clothing like and blankets and stuff i think like sure. stuff that, yeah but he it, it does mention it though like he's just like we don't i didn't have all like the actual stuff he's like but i don't think that matters or he i don't remember how he worded uh, no, it but I, again i know what pike was trying to get me to feel here <laughs> I, just, I just i think it worked I, I feel like if rack is doing him a favor reanimating his dead wife to give birth to a dead child so that he can set them on fire is not the favor. Maybe, I don't know. Honestly, look, I'm not, I don't know. I'm just saying, like, okay, so the alternative, though, is he forever has this hole where he never got to see his child. Okay, he never, I, like, got I, to I've got a better goodbye. alternative, Cassie. Okay. Rack 
lifts the coffin up, turns mm-hmm. it into a funeral pyre that he can have a proper funeral for his ex. Wife. This man just walked out of a cave after 5,000 years. He's not trying to go Cooper, through with all this these This is how they used to do it in the caves. <laughs> Maybe. It could have been. You never know. Maybe they didn't have just... a bunch of fancy stuff. He's just like, what? I... Honestly, though, if I were him, too, I'd be like, uh, I gave you your wife and baby, and they're alive, sort of, again, to say goodbye. To, to like, burn them. You're welcome. Just... Yeah. Like, I, don't know. I mean, this is but... monkey's paw shit. It, it is, but no, you're you're not wrong. You're, this is yeah. want my wife back. Oh, there's something scratching at the door. Dear God, she's the horror! Not evil though. Like even he says, like she's not trying to scare him. She's no, not I trying know. to like. I think I think it's a matter of the way it's written and what's happening versus Pike's intent. So <laughs> it's kind of like it is written as a horror scene. Yes. And Pike afterward has the characters talking about it as if it was a lovely scene. It's like you have to use different words to portray that when you're, when you're describing the situation. That's, that's it. That's it. Yeah. It's a t- if it's Govinda a t- is the point of view character for that scene. So if he's horrified, I, the audience should be horrified. It's a tone issue. I feel. Yeah. I think he's horrified at first though, but then like by the end of that scene, he's not anymore. Like he, it, it is horror until a certain point. Like I feel like it turns when he's there's like an acceptance, and then he's like, then she's put to rest. Like she rested peacefully with the baby, and they burned up until there was nothing left. Like the end of it seemed more peaceful than horror it, to me. It did. I just i I don't feel Not like Rock brought it. this through. <laughs> no. Okay. I, I I do look. I'm just gonna. I do completely get where y'all are coming from, and I. <laughs> I understand that he could have done it in a way that maybe was less terrifying and <laughs> to but I don't think he was concerned about scarring. I think he was like, there's this darkness anger that you're holding on to this, something that you can't move past. I need you to move past this because I need you to marry Julie and raise this baby. So they're not evil. Yeah. I, maybe I do like in the think, second book. I, think, I, I do feel that it is in character for rock to do it the way he did because he does seem a very blunt character mm-hmm. like, yeah, he, like he's not trying to make it pretty right. he's just trying to get it done you know like and i, under, I can respect <laughs> which is, that which is, like, which is how you handle trump tra- somebody's trauma so just just get done just just feel yeah. better okay <laughs> yeah no and i i understand i do get what you're saying but I mean, here's your please. here's your dead wife and dead baby set him on fire too. he did though he did he stepped up to the plate and he was like on fire now and they're peaceful and this is as it should be and now i'm stronger like that's what happened and so rock is just like patting himself on the back as he walks back to his cave so like, that problem <laughs> uh, yeah he's like wiping his hands he's like ah oh, another guy like i'm a good god <laughs> another satisfied customer <laughs> It was like I don't disagree, but I think it was a cool scene. Like I think Oh no, it, it was, was an scary. awesome scene. Like, it was definitely just... a memorable, interesting scene. Yeah. yeah. I just I thought it was scary, but also sad, but also nice. Like Yeah. Maybe not. Things. I mean it's it Yeah. Cause okay. I, when I when I'm just ex- describing it, I'm like, yeah, he his wife rose from the dead and then gave birth and then he had to burn them again. Yeah. Like when you just say it like that, I understand that it's it sounds really bad. Well, but... let me make a suggestion. This is another okay. one of our let's edit Pike scenes. Uh, what if the scene was longer and took up some of the space of, let's say, literally anything that could have been removed from this book? And what would you there was happened? a gradual transition from the horror to the beauty. Like maybe he saw his wife's face there and saw that she was hurting for the ancestral burial that she should have had. And then he understood why Rack was doing this. Instead of this entire shift from horror to peace happening in a paragraph. Yeah. I'm- yeah, I do agree that it could have been long. And I think if she had become beautiful, like, in a, like, been more, like, normal as she had been in life at the very end, that would have been sweeter for him yeah. and less traumatic. And yeah. less traumatic, yeah. yeah I, I agree. Because, yeah, it's not like she... Like, he saw her as a corpse, and she'd been dead for, like, what, like, a year or six months or something? Yeah. And then the baby couldn't have looked good. Um, <laughs> um, like, and so maybe, like, where I said, like, he never got to see his baby, at least this time he did, like, maybe it would have been be- better had the baby looked as it would have 
Yes. Had it been carried to term and there we go. That is what a normally. good God would have done. But uh, I don't, we don't know if he's a good God. We, we have no idea what he is. No, no. He doesn't yeah. let people, he, he's not somebody and who lets him, people close. No, <laughs> and for his character, as he's written, like Rock, how he seems, it does seem like this is what he would have done. Okay. No, I, I'll give don't you that. Don't you think? Like, he wouldn't have stopped to make I, her more beautiful I guess and stuff. where I'm looking at it is I, I don't feel, Govinda is such a kind of, like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He's like, he's a very cautious character. Mm-hmm. I feel, I just, the impression I got from him was not that he, this is how he would have felt at the end of that scene, had it been with the, I don't know, Rock's rush job, I guess is what I'm going to call it. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? Like it's kind of like, can you can you give me ten minutes here instead of five seconds to process yeah. this? Yeah, I I understand that too. But then I think, like, if you're forced into it, he's just like, I didn't expect this shit. I'm here now. Yeah, like, no, uh, no, I okay, get that. This is what I got to do. So I I don't know. Like I, I can know. understand it from both sides, but I I think on TV, and that's another scene that would look really. Cool. Oh yeah, no, oh, yeah. I, and I do think he, I think. I don't know. That's another thing with the writing where I'm just like, if this has been written in a way that I felt it differently I guess you know like and an actor can do that and that's one of those things I I I agree with Cooper about the action scene before and and this scene now I'm like it really does feel like Pike had a movie in his head and he was kind of describing it as he went instead of more like I am writing a book yeah because I feel like he was pretty famous at this time and Fall into Darkness, the TV movie, was going to happen in 96. So it must have already been and production. When this yeah, out. so yeah, I so wonder if he's he now, yeah. yeah, he's now writing knowing, hey, I'm going to be a famous adapted author. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that then movie he was, just like, wasn't. It was like a lifetime movie, right? So it was like an adult yeah. movie. Yeah. So maybe he's like, okay, here's the adult book. Now they're going to know who I am. They're going to know my name. And then, like, he wrote this, expecting them to know his name and get another movie. And then. Well, that's the thing. Like, when I was reading these as a kid, I couldn't understand why they'd never adapted them. Yeah. Like, I I sort of got this idea in my head well, people don't adapt teen novels. And then when Kevin Williamson adapted I Know You Did last summer. It was just like, oh, maybe maybe people do adapt teen novels. But then still, no Pike. And it, it was so weird to me because he was such an important part of my formative years that not only no Pike, but no one was talking about him once I became an adult until, you know, this is what Twitter is good for. And it makes sense because, like, I can totally see why you would think that it was going to happen because, I mean, Goosebumps got a show. Yeah, it right. wasn't a great show, but they got a show. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, it wasn't show. a great series. Oh, I'm sorry, it's Cassie. I love that series. <laughs> <laughs> I put them on. I put the Haunted Cassie. Mask episode on the other day, yeah. and me and Rich were watching Haunted it. Haunted Mask the is mask good. The face. It's so good, and I'm like, oh, this is iconic. I love like, this. I'm never gonna of, put a weird mask on. When I think of Goosebumps stuff that is like above the rest of it, it's definitely the Haunted Mask. It is. Like, yes, that is legit so, scary. I will say some of them are not like some of them are not that great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, R.L. Stein is the poor man's Christopher Pike. I thought Dean Koontz was the. No, Dean Koontz is the poor man's Stephen King. And then, okay, so because last time, okay, last time. <laughs> I was on, we were talking, I was talking about Dean Koontz and you were like, oh, Dean Koontz and Christopher Pike are pretty, pretty much on the same level there. So. Really? I've never read Dean Koontz. I don't know. Mm. That was also on the last episode. I just listened to the last episode. I, oh, I, only I think, I, I, think I was stuff. talking about it more like, like King writes like crazy, but almost all of his stuff with the exception of a writer wearing a blue chambray shirt. <laughs> is somewhat unique yeah um Kuntz writes quickly and all of his stuff echoes each other mm. pike is the oh, same way got it yeah got that it. is very pikey yes no that I sounds understand. like you have just been talking about christopher pike that's what but i was it, that's why i was confused i think <laughs> but because christopher pike predominantly wrote for teens and wrote so quickly, I give him more of a pass 
then I'll give an adult author like Dean Koontz yeah. because he didn't need to write so quickly. And it feels like he was just trying to catch up to Stephen King. And and Pike, and I don't want to just like repeat, 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 but it's just like Pike, Pike does unique things that you don't see in other books, yeah, in other YA books especially, and like, and it's just it is it is so charming in those books, and like I I have a stack of Pike books now because of because of the Pike cast, <laughs> like they, and they're mostly the YA ones except for this, and like I flip, I haven't got to read others besides Starlight Crystal yet, but I have flipped mm. through them, and I'm just like, this is so exciting. These are yeah. so interesting. And I'm just like, I got to this and I was just like, I was just like, <laughs> the, the charm of that is not there in this book. This, this, this does feel like a lesser Dean Koontz book to me. Um, Boy, I can't get, wait till we get to the ratings on here. I, <laughs> I think it's going to be fascinating. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. Wait, sorry. No, no, Cassie, no, no. Because Cassie, it seems like, I don't know, last time I was on here, Becca really hated the Starlight Crystal. <laughs> well, I think I did too. Once I realized it made no sense to me. I still love that book, y'all. I'm not no, even going to lie. Cassie, I'm with you on the Starlight Crystal. You and I are good on the Starlight Crystal. I Again, I feel, I feel like I should have given it another half pike um, <laughs> after reading this book. Okay, well, let's. Uh, we got a lot more to do, so let's let's get through it here. Um. Okay, so in the plot, we're 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 nearing the end, and we get the big confrontation between Doctor Lawrence Moray and Sarah slash Sandra Moray as she's realizing she's Sandra, and starts calling him Dad, which is creepy. And he realizes that he married his daughter, which is creepy, but it's played very well, I think, just how creepy it is. But then in the middle, well, not in the middle, he's drinking <laughs> whiskey when she comes in. And next to the whiskey bottle is a medical beaker <laughs> with a three-month-old aborted fetus flopping around in it. <laughs> And he asks, don't you have a question about this? <laughs> Isn't this insane that there's a three-month-old aborted fetus, your three-month-old aborted fetus, flopping around in here? And she doesn't care. And then he tries desperately to get her to care. It's still alive. I've experimented on it for years, and it refuses to die. That is the most batshit insane thing this book could have done. And I kind of love it for it. I have I love that they've been hinting it because like they, they were like there's this little garage or whatever, the shed right. this yeah. locked door. And, and like, there was something moving in his in safe. Yeah, yeah. I have to wonder why he didn't have concerns about her prior to this point in the book. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's got to be the cold one's power, right? I assume so. Like I feel he, like he was he, just he, maybe he him? walled off the the concerns about the wife from his uh, medical research and everything. I don't know. It's it's really weird. He walled off a lot of things, to be fair. Yeah, but he was also very like full of himself and convinced oh, yeah, that totally. he was not mediocre when like. You kind of are. I mean, you're a good like heart surgeon or whatever, but like, I mean, That's I'm not sure evidenced that within the book. Brain. No, yeah, you kill your only patient you're working <laughs> on. So, like, are you that great, sir? Like, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta go back to the fetus. <laughs> They're fighting, and he stomps the upper half of the flopping fetus. He grounded into the floor, blood and tissue squirted over the carpet. The legs that were little more than a tail continued to kick. And then if this is not enough, the cold one then wipes up what was left of the fetus and then shoves it down the garbage disposal. <laughs> the thing wouldn't stop kicking. Best to have the mess out of the way. I mean, I, I totally would understand why why any reader would hate this 
I totally get it. Did she eat people? Wasn't she a cannibal? Why didn't she like make it into like a smoothie or something? <laughs> I just, I'm, a, I'm just she should be practical like i don't think she actually ate people i don't think oh, did she, she did not? no oh uh, okay right it was the ones who were getting changed but not fully that were eating right people. right yes. okay. susan okay. ate people but she could have given susan a baby smoothie susan was dead yeah susan oh, was dead she died in the mall point. okay at the mall she had no more babies to give this baby smoothie too no okay. so just right. you know garbage disposal waste what a waste of a smoothie <laughs> And again, one of those things like, well, you don't see that every day. That is so true. I really, really have to give it to an author who gives me something I've I've not seen before. And as horrifying as that <laughs> is, I'm I'm a, I'm I'm impressed. This this was a pike. You did your thing here. All right. Was that technically like his baby and his grandbaby at the yes. same time? Yes. What a fucked up family. What a <laughs> fucked up family indeed. You talk about, yeah, you talk about that flowers from the attic family. Well. <laughs> you didn't get a fetus in V.C. Andrews. Not like this, <laughs> at, at least. At least they had the decency to leave their incest in the attic. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's move on a little bit. Well, because there's more incest. We're not done. There is. There <laughs> is. So, so one. So that from the moment we got the, you mean she had twins? Yeah. What a it, twist! It was yeah. What a twist! But I immediately knew it was uh, Peter. Right, because he was in the be. orphanage. And... But I had forgotten the orphanage part. <laughs> so, here's the thing. And uh, if you have not seen the movie Angel Heart, have you two seen the movie Angel Heart? I've never even heard, heard, of heard of it. Okay, because I want to talk about it, but it's got a great twist. Is it that? Oh no, it's from, it's from the year before I was born. Yeah. Is that okay? I'm okay. Yeah, with I it. don't. Okay. So, listeners, if you haven't seen Angel Heart, first of all, go see Angel Heart. Because it's amazing and terrifying, and Robert De Niro plays the devil. And it's not subtle, because his name is Louis Cipher. So, I mean, come on. Um, but the end is a big twist, and uh, it, it was, it's got Mickey Rourke screaming, what, what was the name of the boy? And in this book, Peter says, what happened to the boy? And it's it's just like it's a direct riff on Angel Heart. Like I would not be surprised if it's specifically Angel Heart lodged in uh Pike's brain there. Because it's it's a good twist. Um but yeah, it's yeah. See Angel Heart. <laughs> it it's it's amazing. And Mickey Rourke's actually a good actor. Who knew? It has Lisa Bonet. And it's the movie that got Lisa Bonet kicked off the Cosby show. Oh. Be because Why would she, kick off? she has very, very wild, racy sex with Mickey Rourke in it. Oh, her boobies are showing in this, yeah, it's, this picture of it. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, uh, it's, yeah. And covered in blood. And I, I guess that was too much for Bill Cosby uh, because she was also <sighs> awake. You see what I did there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fuck Bill Cosby. Anyway. I'm looking at the cover of this movie. I've never, like, this is not familiar at I all. I oh, this screenshot of Robert De Niro in the suit with the blood on the wall. And yeah. That's yeah. That, but I never knew what it was from. I've never even seen that. It like... is so good. And it's, it's, like a, it's like a noir movie. And it takes place in New Orleans. And there's voodoo. And, oh, it's so good. I love it so much. Anyway, go see Angel Heart. Watch Angel Heart. You'll love it. I think. Maybe. Lisa Bonet's name. <laughs> don't, don't, don't blame me. There's, there's you that. don't get your money back for this. This is it. Take the recommendation and go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Back to this book. 
Okay, we're we're hit the climax. Uh, Sarah, naked in the hot tub, is trying to get Peter to fuck her. After she killed, quote unquote, after she killed Julie. her husband. Oh, and, and Julie. No, she didn't kill her husband. He's Wait, in you... Iowa. Yeah, he's going right, to kill Sandra. Right, right, right. Never mind. Okay, so yeah, he killed, but he Peter doesn't know she killed Julie, does he? No, I don't think so. Because she tells him, "Oh, she's on her way." It seems like that is an important thing that he never finds out. I mean, she never finds out what happens to him. Yeah, that's true, because he just dies there. And she gets taken away to India. Interesting. Loose threads. Um, So Matt shows up. Because apparently this whole thing has been like in the space of two days. He shows up with, with a paper, apparently, to deliver his paper to Sarah. Uh, because the address was on the back of the thing. And Sarah murders Matt very quickly. That's so sad. It yeah. Is. I remember that one. Like, I do remember that death from when I was younger. And that made me really sad when I was younger. Because I was like, there's no reason for this. Like, this poor guy. Right. Meanwhile. You're right. Dr. Lawrence Moray is in Iowa with the uh comatose sandra uh who i have a i have a great uh description here her face wasn't merely sunken and wrinkled it had slipped through a crack in reality her skull seemed tense as if it were trying to wrestle its way through the tissue layer of what remained of her facial flesh it's intense so he's going to cut her air tube and, and kill her because then that'll kill Sarah. It's like a vampire thing, but not. Uh, yeah. So there's there. Um, so dying, Peter decides he's going to go with her because he should be together. Like it's this weird romance thing still. And then. I'm going to give Matt my my breath. So Matt's back to life. Surrounded by dead people at this point. That's, again, trauma. I didn't think of that. Yeah. Matt wakes up. Everybody's dead. His, oh, my God. I didn't think of that His friend and either. protector, Peter. The person he's had since he was a child. Yeah. Like, looking after him. Dead in front of him. So, They're again. dead in a hot tub. Yeah. Good stuff. But terrible. Oh my god. No. I wonder if the book two would have would have had more Matt. I mean it would have to, right? Unless he just like forgot he was a character and was like <laughs> just didn't follow back up with him at all. I like, see that happening. It was like, oh so shit, I, I gotta bring yeah. Matt back. Yeah. I remember like I was like, oh good, he's not really dead, but I didn't think about what comes after and now I'm like, oh poor Matt. Like yeah. How traumatizing. Can you Oh, I'm getting all sad. I just picture him like crying and being like, Pete, Pete, like, oh. I, I am honestly really glad that he didn't try to milk that emotion from us. That's you. That's fair, yeah. Because he really it up on could have there. Yeah. Yeah. So Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's the plot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, then Govinda and Julie. There's an epilogue, but it's not like. Oh, yeah. The, in the epilogue, Govinda and Julie are uh, are friends. Reuniting. Yeah. And Govinda's in love with her because, of course. And then she's got baby Kali. Yep. And uh, apparently Julia's child, which makes me laugh, will come back in the Cold One Two seedling. And she looks just like her aunt, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Of course. At least the epilogue wasn't 60 pages like the Starlight Crystal. Well, yeah, it, it, it's, it's like, Pike, this is not an epilogue. This is a chapter. Just because your third act takes place after the climax does not mean it's the epilogue. <laughs> so let's talk about the villain, the cold one. I mean, we've we've definitely talked about it a lot. But there is there is some interesting stuff in the um, descriptions. I I really enjoyed that the cold one was learning yeah. and was the it 
like it could not easily replicate itself. It had initial as it had initially believed. It had tried a number of times and failed. Either the humans died or they became murderous beasts devoid of self control. And then there's this description of what happened with Ralph. It had told him to go home and act normal, but Ralph had immediately eaten and killed his 10 year old daughter in that order. That's another fucked up thing. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, also Ralph and the aquarium. In this one reminded me of the immortal and Ralph and the aquarium and the fish watching them have sex. Yes, totally. <laughs> yep. Totally. Every time an aquarium is mentioned for the rest of it's, my it's life. It's going to be fish sex. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because of, and then they had a Ralph too. I was like, are you serious? Fight? Come on. And Ralph is such an uncommon name. It is. I've never met anybody named that in real life. I think. <laughs> I, I really like the cold one didn't understand why most of the deities humans worshipped were in constant need of compliments. Mm. I too wonder that. Uh, compliments are nice. What are you talking about? <laughs> yes, but if you're a deity, you don't need them. You don't need them, but they're still nice. Okay, like a little fine. cherry on top. Are you defending deities who are needy? No. <laughs> I'm just saying I can understand if you're like at the top of the top, you'd still want to be told, Hey, you're pretty fucking rad. Like, you know, like <laughs> I just feel like that no matter how good you are, like you're still gonna, you're still gonna want a pat on the back every now and then. like, yeah. Okay. But, but some of them don't earn it. That's fair <laughs> and true. And those ones don't deserve it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this, this I believe is from the preacher scene. Certainly the genitals, if ripped off, would upset the man greatly. <laughs> oh, and finally, I was looking for this. This is already painful for you, the cold one said, but I don't feel anything. Maybe I don't love you. Let's see. The cold one returned to pulling out the ribs one by one with its hand. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was that, looking for that for that you whole the whole mood time. And vibe, dude, like that, like detached, like, huh? Let's see what's gonna happen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, I love it so much. And and if it first happens, like, doesn't she first just jam her finger in his chest and pull out one and be like, huh? <laughs> yeah, and she's just like screaming. Yeah, so good. Yeah, like <laughs> so honestly, his that whole little um relationship with between her and and pastor craig or is that his name um preacher craig i don't yeah. that's what i wrote him down I don't as. <laughs> um was really interesting just because his fixation was so strange and she was perplexed by it as much as as much as you know we would be i think right um and it was just it it made an interesting to con uh no, not to caught me. Um, whatever. Um, just the whole like it seemed like he wanted to court her, but also convert her. Yeah, and it was just when well, and using his preacher power, you know, power of uh, authority right. to get in the young convert's pants, which is interesting, also because he didn't really have any power, but she did. Hmm. But he didn't know that. <laughs> He thought he had the power. He didn't find out. Yeah, he was, he was trying to take out advantage. His, pulling out his McRibs. That's what, he, <laughs> <laughs> that's what he gets. Trying to take a girl back. Like, you know that she's like, you could, there were vibes there. And he was I've, just I've like, oh, yeah. I've got some books back at the apartment you should read. And then they, when they talk about how they get there, he just gets drunk. Doesn't even talk about the books to her. Yeah. And it's just like, loosey goosey. I mean, there, there's actually a lot to that character. And it's it's some really interesting stuff because you get the idea that he doesn't do this. You know, like a lot of a lot of um this type of character have been doing this forever. Like this is their jam. They go after the vulnerable and then they get what they want from them, right? But the way it's portrayed, it doesn't seem like he does this often, and this may be the first time. That he's actually thought, hey, this might happen. This might work. And then it goes so horrifically bad. <laughs> and it, it's just really interesting to me. I think part of it, too, is like, it seems like he's struggling, like, himself yeah. with what's happening. Because yeah. he's like, he knows he shouldn't be having sex with this girl. And then he's like, he tries to convince himself. He's like, well, you must love me. because And, right. and because right. we love each other, like, it's okay that we did this. Like, 
And then she's like, haha, yeah, sure, whatever. Anyways, about your ribs. <laughs> Break. I just, I fucking love and it. That was another one of those things where I'm just like, the, the Susan and the Susan and Jerry subplot, this subplot were way more interesting relationships than like Peter and Julie. Yeah. Yeah. I do agree with that. If, if they had never gone back to the, oh, oh, I love him, but he loves this other person. It's like, oh my God, why, Pike? Why? This is an adult book. We don't need this. Right. We don't need it. Because there is some really interesting, deep stuff in here. And it's it's just got this teen novel sitting on top of it. I like that she's... Um, a lot of the bad guys in these books have a reason to be bad. And I don't think... Like, she could have just as easily been like, I don't understand why I'm like this. I'm going to be build clocks. Like, she yeah. could have done anything. But it's just so random. And, like, she doesn't do it with hatred and she doesn't do it with like she's not she's just curious like mm -hmm. and i think i think it's interesting because as i i get that she's a bad guy and so maybe this is my part where i identify with people <laughs> that i shouldn't again but like so by the end of the book she's starting <clears throat> to feel emotion she's starting to understand she feels like her first one that gets introduced is anger which i also i do like because mm -hmm. for me personally that is my strongest emotion that i have like when i have like moments of feeling detached and stuff like anger is always the first one that comes back like mm -hmm always and so i thought that was really interesting um and then if they hadn't died i feel like she could have maybe learned you don't need to kill everybody you're just different yeah and gone on and like lived a life like that was different but you know her own like so it's so weird because it didn't have to end this way in the hot tub with like dead bodies right. and like all this stuff going on like she could have she was a bad guy yeah very thoroughly but she could have gone on to live a life and not been bad if and she that's just when that's when you to. also wonder about the um the inevitability of it all like if this is the resurrection of these uh ancient hindu deities was this the plan you know did this have to happen in order to get kali it's a lot of random stuff that had to have happened <laughs> But then, then you know, it's it's the divine plan, right? Is it random? I mean, it you it know. feels that way when you take Rock into account because yeah. he's like, oh, it's time to go. Um, like, like he's, he's been waiting, waiting for time. this, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and part of it is I just watched the the first season of Good Omens last night, which dealt with very similar. This is inevitable. This is going to happen. So we just need to deal with that and figure out what to do around it. So I, I feel like I'm reading a little bit of that into this. Well, so I don't know, though, about the inevitability, because I feel like it was based down to a decision of her as the cold one. Because when the when the voice stopped, she could have – he didn't leave until the voice stopped and she started killing. So, like, that's when he left his cave. Right. Because mm -hmm. up until that point, she could have decided, like, the voice stopped. What am I going to do? I'm going to make clocks. And I don't think he would have left the cave. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't think any of this would have happened. I don't think the little collie clone would have been born. Like, right, because it's not like Peter was, was triggering him to leave the cave either. Right. Um, it was specifically – Specifically, her choosing to be bad and to kill people and end humanity. Hmm. It is a very intrigue. Like I like the cold one as a villain quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Same. And to the point where I will, I want more for sure. Book two. Book two. <laughs> Book two. I'm curious, <laughs> I, and because I am, yeah, I'm curious what the perfect cold one she talks about would have been like mm -hmm. from from if she and peter had had their you know twin cess baby <laughs> um <laughs> but we i think it would have just been because remember how they were talking about how people were like she was so beautiful but people were just put off by her like they just did not like her they were not attracted to her like in general as a person like they found her attractive but they didn't want to be near her mm -hmm. um i feel like in her mind then the perfect cold one would be somebody who's like her, but that people are not repulsed by. So Maybe. basically she wants the combination of her and Peter. Exactly. She wants someone yes. who can pass in the world. Yes. And... But who is her, who is yeah. like her. So yeah. she's not alone. Yeah. I think so. I think that's what it would have been like. Cause, cause the... And I guess we're going to see. Well, <laughs> we'll, we'll be. Or not. <laughs> or <laughs> we could have seen it. Um, I, Cause see, I was, 
I had, I got went off on a different direction with it. Cause like, okay, so if Julie's baby is going to be Kali incarnate, I almost wonder if, because all this is part of this divine plan, would it be some other God? Mm-hmm. And then you've got two different, like two different incarnated deities, essentially calling themselves a God of death. I don't know. I just feel like there could have been, could be something interesting with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like Gozer. Yeah. There definitely yeah. could have been things he did more with this that I'm very sad. He just left it as it was. Yeah. Maybe he was like, well, they didn't make it into a movie. Fuck this. It could be that. <laughs> like, he just puts the thing in the end that's as a tear is. Because, yeah, like, did I, it just not sell well? Or is it because it didn't be, make it didn't become a movie? Right. I, I want to ask him. We should ask him directly on Twitter. We should do that. This, uh, yeah. <laughs> He's going to see the notification from us. <laughs> oh, <laughs> fuck them name. again. He's going to be like, God's oh, Cooper again. <laughs> Jesus. Won't they go away? <laughs> He's like, God, it's not bad enough. They're ripping apart my books every damn episode. <laughs> yeah. Oh, more edit notes, Pike cast. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, do you want to do this? Do you want to write these yeah. books? <laughs> Maybe I should stop and you, I'll do a podcast <laughs> on your books. He's like, I'll just sit back since you guys are the famous writers for the last 30 years. No problem. We have not heard from Pike in a while, so we do not know how he feels he's just, the Pike. He's just, he's, just, he's just muted the Pike cast. Yeah. No, I think that one time he t- he was like, I am aware of your podcast. Yeah. No, he did say he liked our thoughts on... Uh, on was it Whisper of Death, I Whisper think? Whisper of Death, yes. Yes, yes. So we got him... That's honestly that that's a goal for me. Like that's just cool. I'm I can oh, yeah. like die oh, yeah. happy as my childhood self. Like thirteen year old Cassie would be like, "What? Christopher Pike listened to a podcast you're on about his <laughs> books? Oh my god! Yeah. Like I'm basically famous to my own self as a child. There right you now, go. So I peaked. Who's also wondering <laughs> what a podcast is? Yeah, no, no, yeah, fair, fair. I'd be like on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> you're on the radio. <laughs> Okay, well, now I hope he doesn't listen to this episode. <laughs> well, shall we move into thirst? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so as, as we've talked about, there are two types of thirst in Pike's work. There's thirsty, thirsty love, which we already talked about, the desperation to be in love, and thirsty, thirsty sex. Yes, I came prepared for this one. Yeah, yeah I've got no. You want to go first? <laughs> for one time, I actually do have a quote. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, that amused her. I'm looking at you. Yeah, but I don't plan on eating you. She wrinkled her nose. A pity. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Do you have any, Haley? Yes. Uh, not all of them are sexy, sexy. Some of them are uh, just weird, sexy. That's okay. If they're about sex, <laughs> they count in the Okay, so section. this one from Peter made me kind of like do a blank face. It's like, he had no difficulty having sex with a woman he didn't love as long as she liked him and she didn't press charges in the morning. Oh, yeah. That's in my problematic yeah. section. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then... There was nothing sexy about having a vacuum cleaner welded to one's lips, <laughs> which I I didn't. I read that paragraph twice, and I couldn't understand why that sentence was there. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, about Stan, uh, Stan Fraser wasn't an intellectual, but he had the bo- his body was the stuff of orgasms. Yes, yes, the stuff of orgasms. And then one more. Uh, I forget who this was referring to, but the happy <laughs> the happy sperm punched through the rubber as if they were on their way to a party. I have that one right here, yeah. <laughs> I also the sentence before it is they use condoms and one climactic afternoon the thing broke. <laughs> and that's just fun. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Shall I move on? Yeah. I, that's yeah. all I have. <laughs> okay. uh, Susan wanted to get wet one last time, she said with a leer, before she got real wet. <laughs> subtle. Yeah, yeah, real subtle. Real subtle. <laughs> um, it, oh, yeah, here's the, he wasn't an intellectual, but his body was the stuff of orgasms. Uh, he undid the top button. The word is yes, or I keep going. She stopped laughing and folded her arms across her chest. 
keep going then. At least I'll know if the saying is true. What saying is oh. that? Once you go black, you never go back. Oh, that was my problematic section. <laughs> I think that was supposed to be my problematic section. Sorry. No, it's okay. That I mean, it's kind of, yeah. it's both. It is. It it's, is both. It is. I uh, wrote Y in big letters next to that <laughs> in my book. <laughs> Um, it was like I could read her mind for a moment, and I can state for the record that Thompson is no lesbian. The two naked men she had in her mind and the things they were doing to her body, she must have seen on a porno movie. She couldn't have done something like that in real life, I would think, and still be able to sit down the next morning. Oh my fucking god. Which we find out she was reading a book. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's reading a book. That probably in the '90s did not have DVP in it. For a second, I thought you said DVD in it, D- and it took me it it took me it took me long enough that I had to bring it up and mention it. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, did they not have DVDs? I guess not. They- <laughs> Do you think I should explain to our listeners what DVP is? I think if oh, they yeah. if they don't know, they can look it up. Maybe yeah, you, you, you Google it. Google that. <laughs> then if you don't if you like don't know, well now you know. Like Google it, not around other people. Maybe no, no, not a, not on uh, yeah. and, not and like not, on public maybe in maybe in private mode. In, uh, not around your children. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Maybe on your phone surreptitiously. <laughs> like while you're pooping, so that well, I maybe not. Maybe not. Cassie. Like while you're in the, I just, I meant like while you're in the bathroom. No, I, I love that, but... Cassie. Just, just so casual. You know, while you're pooping. <laughs> and that's that's another office thing. You know, just pooping. You know how I be. <laughs> okay, his penis came out hard and throbbing. The cold one teased the organ with its fingernails, and the preacher leaned his head back and groaned. Already he was feeling so much, and still the cold one felt nothing. It pulled off his pants and stroked his testicles. It's so clinical. It, the, the organ <laughs> is the part that I like laughed while I was reading it, because I was like, the organ? Like, I'm not ever looking at a dick and thinking like, wow, I'd like to touch that organ or anything <laughs> like that. Like, who, who the heck? To be fair, with that being in the cold one's point of view, it does make sense. Yeah, it that's does. True. It does. Yeah, totally. I at I, least I, I it wasn't his that. manhood. That would have been worse. Yeah, that's terrible. Um, the, they'd made love three times Friday night, and she had come every time—a record for her. I just feel like I feel bad for her, and I think she needs to just go find another guy because Peter's a like a dead end. <laughs> go to Govinda. <laughs> like Govinda could probably like rock your world, girl. Go. That's true. Just get away from Peter because he is. Peter's a, a loser. We don't like Peter. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't After try. Okay, okay, he doesn't try because everything comes easily to him. Yeah. Yeah. And, so and he's so already in love here. with Sarah. Elevate him point. to like God status. She's like, oh, you made me come. You're amazing. Like, he's a basic ass dude. Right. Like, yeah. Mm. <laughs> After Julie Moore had left, Sarah walked into the backyard and stripped off her clothes on the pool deck. It didn't surprise him. She was fond of swimming naked. Finally, she surfaced and walked toward him, still naked. The shower of sunlit drops on her exquisite skin, a multifaceted prism of sensuality. Fantastic. I love these pool scenes. Yeah. Bas- basically, it is uh, what is scavenger hunt, right? The That's the one that opens with the uh, the siblings in and the, the naked swimming. Is it? I don't well, remember. This is, one that, this is a scene of, of the father and daughter with the naked it swimming. It is. It so. is. Icky, icky uh, skinny dipping. Yeah. Well, to be fair, the father's not swimming because he doesn't know how. No, he doesn't know but how. In all this that's time, important. he hasn't taken swimming yeah. lessons. Like, you're, you watch your wife drown and you don't take swimming lessons? Yeah, that, that's weird. <laughs> You've got a pool in your... I mean, he what? did kill her. Right. Well, yeah. But why does he have a pool then? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, why if, have if a you, pool? Yeah, if you don't, you know, to 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 attract a certain kind of woman who he can then kill. Well, and does the... he have a pool, or does he just have a jacuzzi? Because she swims laps underwater, oh, and he he's he does how long laps. she holds right, her breath. Right. Uh, let's see. She crouched beside him. Her long dark hair played in the hot currents. Her full breasts played with his mind. 
Was she still naked? I think so. Crouching down naked? Bold move. <laughs> I, can you just, Im I mean, imagine it. Like, the positioning. Like, that is, like, you don't have any, like, doubts, no lack of self-confidence. You're just like... <laughs> well, I mean, it, it is Sarah. She has no doubts. Or uh, Yeah, I mean, good for her. Like, we love, we love a bold queen, so... And then there's, wouldn't you rather be having sex, she asked. He coughed. Fuck you. Yes, <laughs> please, Peter. <laughs> I remember that. I laughed. <laughs> Good stuff. Okay, shall we move on to Die Softly, our moralizing and problematic section? Yes. <laughs> Obviously, we have mentioned a few problematic things, direct and just overall. There's a lot in this book. There is. There is. The one major one I've got here, and I feel like I know what Blake was trying to go for, but he missed majorly, is when he specifically uses the N-word in a conversation between Jerry yes. and uh, Fred. Mm -hmm. And it's not the N-word with an A, which is bro. It's the regular N-word. Right. So there's that. Yeah, yeah I, was, I, was, I was stunned to see that. Yeah. That I was, I literally like my eyes like got really big, and I was just like, "Oh my god!" Yeah. I, like, I expect that. Like I've seen, like Stephen King has written that and stuff, but I wasn't yeah. expecting yeah. it with Christopher yeah. Pike. Me either. I did not remember that as a thing. And I mean, part of Stephen King's whole thing is he will write exactly the way people talk. You know, so if he's writing a racist character, that racist character will be legitimately racist. And he pulls no punches there. This did just stand out like a sore thumb. Right. Yeah. It was like he was trying to be conversational yeah, in exactly. like a dialect that he is not used to using. And he tried to throw a word that he thought would work. And it's not. Right? It, it is not good. It was, it is this not is good an adult book. Awkward. But this is how we do things in adult books. And it's like. Yeah. Mm, mm -mm. Yeah. So we also I'll mention the 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 retarded word is thrown around a lot. Yeah. And slow. They talk yeah. about like slow, slow kids a yeah. lot. And then um in this breathing for the patients on mechanical respiration uh, respirators or many of the well preserved vegetables mm. were in five minutes or less going to turn into applesauce. Now I have to give them credit for a turn of phrase. <laughs> It's not even a vegetable, though. That's I a know. fruit. That's true. So that's so dumb. <laughs> that's true. But <laughs> it's also horrible. Yeah, it's it's bad. And then the thing that didn't freak me out until I realized it wasn't true was Peter wondered if she had been raped after she had gone into her coma 30 years ago down in Mexico. I thought that was going to be a plot point. Me too. When it's not, that's just racist. Wait, what was he? What is it? What is he saying? He's saying that someone in Mexico raped a woman in a coma. Oh, I thought. Oh, I thought he was implying like the husband did it. Or I thought. I, I thought he was implying that the um, the other doctor, the one who was in love with her. Yeah, mm -hmm. like I thought it was somebody. I thought he was he, saying it was someone like that she knew or something. I feel like if he'd been saying that, he would have said that and not emphasize yeah. Mexico. No, yeah. I see what you're no, saying. You're right. oh, gross. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so I'm confused now. <laughs> you tell. Okay, so I, if I'm recalling correctly, the problem, the difference between Peter and Sarah was that she, one was conceived as she was going into the coma and the other was conceived after or... I'm just yes. like, at what point did the sperm enter her body? So, so, so they had sex on the boat. Okay. On the boat. All right. Yeah. And then she, and then he tried. And to then she her said, out. "I'm pregnant." Oh my god. And yeah, then so he like, threw her off sex, the boat. They were cuddling po post coitus, yeah. and then he, she was just like, "Haha, by the way, we're going to start a family." And he was just like, "Oh, bitch, no, we're not." Okay. And yeah. she was like, "Um, yes, I am." And then he backhanded and her. And that's why the other doctor like, said she wasn't pregnant when she thought she was, but then she right. was. Yes. Okay. Because she thought she was getting onto the boat, but she got pregnant that I night. got so mad. That, that line about yeah. about her, somebody, uh, you know, raping her in the coma, like that, which was, you know, not true, but like that messed me up so much for like right. the whole timeline of events. When And it's, it doesn't help that it's made 
uh, clear in offhanded remarks. You know, like this could have been much clearer what happened. I think that's a lot of the book. Yeah, well, very true. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I have two bad ones. Oh, good, good hit. Okay. 13 years old and she could walk into a room and turn the head of every adult male. And I don't mean that in a crude way. First of all, that's fucking gross. Yeah. How's, and how do you not mean that in a crude, crude way? way? Oh, right? <laughs> what other way are grown men looking at a little girl? Like, ew. And then the other one, I don't know if this, this just seemed weird and like not good, but I don't understand what it means even. Um, it says the villains were a mid forties man with a bad hair day ex concentration camp look. <gasps> what does that mean? Like, that's not good, right? Like that. I mean, it, I think what they're, I mean, yes, it, it's very poorly said. They could have described a different way. Yeah. That's yeah. not gross. I, right? um, yeah. Like, I, that's like offensive. But I, I think the ex concentration camp look is really, really skinny and gaunt. Right. So they could have just said he looked like emaciated or yeah, something. Exactly. Like, you didn't have to... Exactly. You don't yeah, have okay. to bring the Holocaust into it. <laughs> right. Okay. Because I was reading it and I had, like I was just like, wait, what? And I kept having to reread this line. I literally wrote what with a question mark next to it in my book. Cause I was like, I I'm pretty sure I'm not getting good vibes from whatever this means. Like I don't like this. Right. Um, and, and yeah. What sucks is the second half of that sentence is actually a pretty cool line. The uh, and a teenage girl who looked as if she'd resented her Barbie from the age of two, which I thought that was interesting because they previously described her as looking very clean cut American, basic blonde, like sweet. Well, she did, so but guess, she's gone feral. It just like I don't know. I I under, I understand it, but I feel like that's like she's supposed to be like animalistic and gross. I'm not like picturing her playing with Barbies. I guess, which is why. Right. I just, I don't know. It was weird. I understand it, but it was weird <laughs> for me. I don't think I have any more bad things other than the the black comment. Yeah. Well, let's move on to the season of passage. Let's start with Pikeisms. We've already talked about the sheer amount of boyfriend stealing and uh, love triangle shit. Um, I've forgotten that it happened yeah here's here's where it was when when i introduced sandy to larry i had loved her already blah 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 yeah it's stupid. <laughs> great old people yeah it, it doesn't matter at all um i was thrilled to see another mcdonald's reference yes and the mcdonald's reference is amazing that smell spoke volumes as did susan's jeffrey dahmer i look like i eat at mcdonald's but i don't really eye contact <laughs> i was waiting for it because there was a denny's mention earlier in the book and i was like denny's but no mcdonald's yeah, yet yeah. what the heck and then exact, i got to that i, I wrote so that exact note cassie <laughs> <laughs> i was like why is it denny's is that he thinks that's the adult one and mcdonald's is the yes, yeah, one? Yeah, that's right. what i thought too i was like oh, okay we're so grown up now we're going to denny's <laughs> <laughs> and then remember pike has a hatred of people magazine he passed the time reading a People magazine and trying not to think. Mutually inclusive activities, to be sure. <laughs> Dang. I mean, really, just... people must have written a bad bike review at one point. He's so shady. <laughs> because he throws shade at them whenever possible. I love it. Anyone else have any pikeisms that I missed? Um, him I... trashing a nothing character. For no reason. Oh, yes. Yes. Right, right, right. Um, because they're, like, when Govinda is at the airport, um, he's describing the uh, travel agent and he's like heavy set and had a fat mustache. Her dowry would have to be high to land a husband. Right, right. I oh forgot my gosh, about I that. I that. Yeah. Like she's just Govinda there for that. thought that about her? Yeah. Rude. Yeah, and I know. Like, and, right. And it's like she's there. And for he's that. one of the good guys. Right. She's there for those two seconds of prose and that's. Yeah. There's always like a frumpy fat character that yeah. Pike loves to point out. It's awful. Very Pike. Though. Poor lady's just doing her job. Like just trying. She's probably like just, oh, I'm just normal day at work. And this man's just like, <laughs> oh, you need a big dowry. She, blah, blah, blah. She just had to schedule a flight for a 5,000 year old guy who just wandered in oh, wearing almost nothing. Was, yes. Yeah. And then she's got she to schedule it for this guy too. too. So he's thinking meanly of her and then putting her through hell after knowing she's been mind fucked. He's yeah, like, exactly. well, what about him? Where was his luggage? Like, how rude. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Shall we move to best writing? Do either yes. of you have anything for that? I have. Sorry, I have. Hang on. I color coded my tab so I would know my bad things from my good things. Ah. Okay, I have this, which is not like super stellar, but it's one of the only times I was like, oh, that sounds pretty in a mm -hmm. book. Well, in a Pike book, to be clear. Okay. But white as well as black were lost in darkness as hope as well as terror were consumed in awe. Oh, that is nice. That's it. That's all I've got. Sorry. <laughs> okay, that's okay. That's <laughs> good. I, uh, that's nice. I have I one have... of the most um, uh, 40s detective noir kind of comments he's had in a long time. Tina Thompson her name tag said, was 40-ish, wearing yesterday's makeup, tomorrow's problems. Ooh. Oh, I like that. Isn't that great? <laughs> Very noir. Yeah. <laughs> I I have one, which is, it's funny because it's about characters, it's about Dr. Moore. I was just like, I don't like his character, but this is such a nice line. They slept together in the same bed, but he believed neither of them ever dreamed of the other. That is a very, it's very evocative. Like it tells you so much in one sentence. Yeah. Um, I've got, uh, let's see, Miss, Miss Suntan Homecoming had done it once too many times with a pale foreign exchange student from the German Black Forest. What? I know, right? What are, what are you even saying? This is, this is this is Julie wondering what she should say uh, after leaving Malibu and Susan Darley. What? I don't know what that? it means, <laughs> but I love it. Say it again. I want to hear it again. Miss Suntan Homecoming oh. has done it one too many times with a pale foreign exchange student from the German Black Forest. I think she's saying vampire. Oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> what a weird way to phrase. Yeah. And Some what? of Julie's internal monologue stuff is really funny. This is just what happens when you're in grad school. Yeah. <laughs> right, here, here's another one here. Tampons, cotton balls, lipstick, Vaseline, Valium. She had it. She could open the door and ask the tall, dark man with the long silver knife if he would please drink her glass of drugged water before he laid her out and opened her up. It had been a warm day. He might be thirsty. <laughs> That's very like Pike humor. Oh, it is. It really is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. The outer space works were disturbing in a subtle fashion. It not only looked as if people would never go to such places, but that they were not welcome to even think about them. Ooh, I like that a lot. That, that's my cosmic horror right there. Was that the one about the painting? Yeah. Those paintings sound so cool, but like at the same time, also some of them, it's really hard to even try to envision. Like, how do you know you're looking up through a crack in coral if you're in the crack oh, I in know, the coral? I know, right? Like it's, but they sound like they would look so cool. Yeah. When I'm, I'm someone who like the idea of deep space and the things to be found in deep space, like not, not aliens or anything, just the, the vastness of the things in deep space terrify me. Like, I'm really obsessed with quasars, and they look horrifying to me. <laughs> and so, stuff like that, I'm I'm sold right away. If you're talking about painting deep space and horrifying things, I love it. I'm all over it. Uh, let's see what I got. Sarah sounded sincere, which is a really <laughs> rough sentence to say. Julie thought. Really, the facts of the woman's great beauty and Peter's obvious interest in her were not reasons why she should automatically despise the bitch. Uh, well, she was on to a good thought there. For... No, right? Isn't that great? <laughs> like, she just ended that real poorly, but she was almost at a really good That's why I love it so much, because just like it goes downhill very quickly in the last one. Yeah. Yeah, because you're like you're like yeah, yeah. Oh, well. You're right. Just because Peter's infatuated with her doesn't mean I shouldn't love the bitch. <laughs> but then again, maybe she's just like there's a bunch of other fucking reasons That's to hate true. her. That's like, true. yeah. yeah. <laughs> and my last one was, but Sarah Moray had been conditioned in the void where a million years was nothing but a moment to forget. I like conditioned in the void. Yeah, me too. That's my cool emo band name. Conditioned in the void. That's that's also a good subtitle for the show. I, I like the typing. He's like, yeah. type, 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 type. Well, 
<laughs> That's one of the hardest things for me to come up with, honestly. So if we come up with one in the middle of an episode, I got to write it down. Good, good. <laughs> okay, I have a few weird lines. I do too. You go first. Okay. Um, this Maybe this should have been in the problematic section now that I think about it, but it's like, <laughs> I don't remember who's talking about this. A male psychic, a male psychiatrist or a female one, and the, aunt, the person saying, a male, of course, someone objective. Yeah, I remember oh. that. Yeah, that, like, that, is that was definitely supposed a... to be sarcastic, though, right? I think. No, I don't think it was sarcastic. Oh, was it not? No, I think it was serious. <sighs> it did oh, not shit. strike me as sarcastic. It didn't strike it. me either. I was just like, yeah, be... well, because it's so like male centric viewpoint is typically considered objective mm-hmm. anyway. So, like, yeah, didn't take that as sarcasm. I, I was like, yeah, that's 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 great that's just sexist that's why i thought it i think that's why i read it as sarcasm and joke because i was like yeah that's so obviously like right ridiculous. exactly yeah. like we know like but i guess no i see what you're saying though like yeah, yeah. i would have been more annoyed <laughs> <laughs> i thought it was a joke <laughs> um one that was she was as dead as something that had been buried for days <laughs> <laughs> that's that's i like that's, it that's that's yeah um, oh, that's very funny. accurate <laughs> um was oh just a whiff of it and his eyes would swell up like dinosaur eggs <laughs> and all i could think I of was the little uh sponge dino things that you oh put yeah water right on. you get them wet and they became slightly bigger yeah oh i thought of i thought of the oatmeal with the dinosaur eggs in it and i was like those aren't very big <laughs> I'm guessing he was going for like dinosaur eggs are big, so the eyes yeah. get big. It's like, but that's not. The... But yeah, who? Who? I mean, in the middle of a book that's not about dinosaurs, right? Who is thinking of dinosaur eggs? Right. Um, this is not even a full sentence. Just Susan's steel ligamented cyborg claw to describe <laughs> <What>? <laughs> to describe how strong it is. Oh my god! I remember that line. Yeah. Okay, and my last one is um this this is this I feel like is a microcosm of the whole book of the whole a long walk down a short road. Okay, yeah. Um, her fingers stretched out like the claws of the junior prom queen who had taken to heart the last horror film she had seen at the drive-in with her werewolf boyfriend. I remember that line. I remember yeah. that too. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Though that is definitely a long walk to get to where you're going. <laughs> Right, that's all of mine. <laughs> okay, speaking of not long walks, this line needs to be heard without context <laughs> because it's amazing. We'll see who's wearing the pussy. <laughs> is that in it? That is. Who says that when? I don't know. He said it. I, I don't remember. <laughs> Honestly, I think it's Stu. Quote. He said it. Yeah. <laughs> he called. Oh, dear. <laughs> I love that the he could be anybody in the book. <laughs> we'll see who's wearing the pussy. Oh, God. Oh. This, this I like just because it's really bizarre. She had pink pajamas on with bears and ponies playing with fat-faced white children. I think he means <laughs> cherubs. Fat-faced <laughs> <laughs> white children. I didn't realize he meant cherubs, and I was like, what the fuck? And I'm still like, what the fuck? <laughs> oh my god, I love my- I, I just- I just I, Can you just- I'm gonna go to Old Navy and just be like, hey, you guys got any PJs with those fat-faced white children on? <laughs> oh god. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> she told him he didn't need to wear a condom as long as he was cool. Which naturally he said he was. Oh, that so that made me. Is that a thing that you don't get a baby before your right but the day before your period? It's it's yeah it's the well like I mean foolproof? it's is it a is it? thing it's it's a it's a possibility <laughs> it's family planning it's the rhythm method. But it's of, not 100%. okay. But it's like no, it's right, not okay. A, so it, that's no. just like pulling out. Right. Like it's just okay, okay. Because when I I read that and I was like, I don't think that's. I don't think that's how that but works. But a lot of people like, do. Sure could. A lot of people think that's how it works. Right. Okay, that's fair. Like, I, like yeah, our right. like our uh, heroine here who forgot that it was actually a week before her period. Right. So she can't plan for when it's going to start. It's yeah. It's, clearly, it's, it's not a, a science. There. No. 
<laughs> but but really the as long as he was cool thing uh to me that says as long as he's clean as long yeah. as he's not carrying an std and as a sex educator i just need to reference that people uh it, it's not about being cool or clean it is about having an sti okay so listeners at home don't say I'm clean when referring to STIs because that implies people who have infections are dirty. And that is not cool. High horse there, <laughs> ladies. High horse. No, I'm not arguing. No, I agree no, with you. You're, I, just, no, you're I didn't know what to say about it. So I was like, I just like agreed. No, I, <laughs> you're I, here. <laughs> I, I just realized I got very serious there. It, 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 it's just it's a very important thing for me. Like it's one of those things that I always call out on Reddit, even though I know the response is going to be awful. <laughs> right up there with it's a vulva, not a vagina. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that from me. But they need to. <laughs> they do, right? Because they don't know the difference. It's a job in the world, Cooper. <laughs> I don't know why word. I took that upon myself. <laughs> I got one more. One thing about Iowa that he liked, he thought, as he got on the highway, was that it was surprisingly a whole lot cooler than Los Angeles. Indeed, from the clouds in the sky, it looked as if it would rain at any moment. He vaguely remembered reading something about heavy thunderstorms in the Midwest. No, a heavy, a heavy thunderstorm the Midwest had had a few weeks back. Tell me you're not from the Midwest <laughs> with one sentence, Christopher Pike. <laughs> there is no a uh, heavy thunderstorm we had a few weeks back. The Midwest gets thunderstorms all the time. <laughs> Fucking California. I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I'm from Florida and California. I didn't know that. I was like, yeah, totally. That one thunderstorm they probably had that one time. They, they would all remember that one storm. Not only remember it, but read about it. Yeah, in California, it's just widespread yeah. like info. That's news there in like Middle America. Yeah. There's not much else no. like going Thunderstorm on. Pretty constant. Pretty constant. <laughs> okay, that's all I've got for uh, season of passage. Shall we move into last act? Yes. Okay. Well, Haley, you know the dealio. Oh. You get to go first out of five pikes. Where? Does the cold one fall for you? I'm, I, I I'm going to be generous. <laughs> you don't have to be with with one pike. <laughs> oh, I, I was going to go with half, but I was like, you know what? There, there's more here. It's not very well focused and stuff, but I'm going to give it one pike, and that wow. pike will be a uh, gloved member. <laughs> The D gloved member. D gloved, sorry, Stan D gloved member. member. Which is like an E. coli salami. Yes. <laughs> yes. Which Jesus. I didn't even know was a thing. An E. coli salami. <laughs> Who knows anymore with these with the stuff in this? I book? mean it could mean anything, it honestly. Organs. Yeah. Like are you it's like, are you cool with, with the E. coli salami? <laughs> <laughs> All right. One D gloved member. That's rough. That is a rough rating. Oh that God. is a rough rating. <laughs> Cassie, what do you got? Um, okay. I have, oh, well, I don't want to, Cooper, do you know what you're going to rate as your extra? Um, I think I know what Cooper's going to rate with his extra. I think so too, and I don't want to steal his. I don't, I don't actually. So I would love to hear what you both think that I'm going to rate with my I extra. I thought you were going to make yours your fetus. Yeah, I did too. Yeah. And so I didn't want to take the fetus. I no, you can go ahead and take the and fetus. But now, now that you mention it, I would have done that. But you can go ahead. It's okay. If you want the fetus, I have a backup. Okay. Oh, if you have a backup, do it. Yeah. I'll give you the fetus. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll give okay. you, you the fetus. I love this conversation out of context. I'm going to take the fetus. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. So, okay. My rating, I'm going to go with. Oh, this is difficult because I liked it a lot when I was younger, but I liked it a lot less well, now. No, this but there is about, this is about your do. overall feeling. So okay. you can take into account younger or you don't have to. Okay, okay, okay. I'm gonna take I'm gonna take into account younger and I'm also going to not let the problematic parts 
because there are so many of them. I'm not going to let that detract so many because if I did, then I wouldn't be left with a rating. So I'm going to I'm going to limit those all to one star. And so I'll detract one full star for like the use of the R word. The okay, N-word. okay, that's like, fair. Actually, I'm going to take one and a half away from that. Okay. So I'm down to three and a half. So I'll give it three pikes and then the half is going to be oh sorry just kidding i'm gonna give it three broken sticking out ribs of a of a rib cage <laughs> and then um a little baby half pike on the bottom <laughs> just like also impaled into his body somewhere maybe in his organ like <laughs> the, like in addition to the fingernails she teased his organ with a half pike okay yeah <laughs> i love it yep <laughs> um okay so i've been all over the map on this I knew what I wanted to give it coming in. I'm not giving it that rating anymore. Wait, I want to know. I was going to come in with four. Ooh. Oh, wow. But what I am going to do, I am going to give it three and a half. And then additionally, it's the half stomped on feeding. <laughs> so that is going to round us up to four. <laughs> With his little kicking legs. Yeah, with the little kicking tail-like legs. We went in a different direction, too, because if I had used the fetus, mine was going to be dropping the fetus into the into the garbage disposal. Ooh, ooh. Yeah. So, so a blended smoothie of a fetus. Yes, yes. So you, you, each, you each went with what I thought you were going to, so that's why I was like, quick, quick, what's something else? Oh, yeah, the, the stands, you know, E. coli. So, yeah. I yeah, yours is good because I'm just picturing that. I'm just like, oh my god, yeah. <laughs> Not, nothing like a nothing like an in uh, you know a unplanned circumcision from like with the assist of a fish, of <laughs> several fish. Maybe. Well, I don't know that yeah. the fish assisted. Well, they were, but they may have there for moral support. Moral <laughs> support. So as as he lay there, the fish were just flopping around like it's okay, buddy. It's okay. <laughs> We're flaccid too. <laughs> oh dear God! <laughs> All right. Well, Haley. <laughs> first of all, we'd love to have you back. I would love to come back. Yes. Okay. Come back anytime. Yes, I would love and to come s- back. <laughs> okay. Even even so. Even okay. So then we would love you to tell our listeners. <laughs> where they can find you and your work online. I'm at, uh, give me one second. <laughs> just, just still picturing the, yeah, the it's fish. All about, all about the flopping, I am picturing uh, fish the fish. The flaccid, <laughs> flopping flaccid fish. Okay. All right. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Right. I'm at uh, www.haleypiper.com. Um, and I'm on Twitter at Haley Piper says, and, uh, on Instagram at Haley Piper fights. And I have three books coming out next year. Whoa. Um, you are a maniac. <laughs> that's what they tell me. <laughs> um, so keep an eye out on that stuff and announcements and things. Definitely. Cassie, where can we find you online? You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Control Alt Cassie, C T R L A L T C A S S I E. And my online shop is shopletsgetgalactic.com. And then I also have a Patreon. So if you want more content that I don't share everywhere else, it is patreon.com slash let's get galactic. And you can find me at Cooper S. Beckett on all the social media. And my books can be found at cooperspeckett.com uh, as well as the spectralinspector.com, which is where my horror stuff lives. And I've got some body horror too, but no penis degloving. <laughs> I mean, there is sex related body horror in my books, but penis degloving, it, it may be a little bit too much even for me. Are there aquariums? There aren't aquariums. Dang. Well, you know what you got to do. The next one. The next one will be, <laughs> I'll put one in just for you, Cassie. And the fish will watch someone have sex. Yes, with their big googly with eyes. Big, big. So it's clearly those those goldfish with the big eyes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, where can, <laughs> Cassie, where can our listeners find our show? You can find us on all social media at the Pikecast. We also have a Patreon that helps us keep the lights on. And you can join our Discord if you're a member of our Patreon where we share a lot of fun chat and early episodes. 
You can also find us on Goodreads. We have a reading group, thepodcast.com slash Goodreads. You can join us there and talk about books. Yay. And I want to ask our listeners uh, if you've enjoyed Beck on the podcast for the last year plus, send her a message on Twitter as told by Beck's. Um, I'm sure she'd really appreciate it. We we love her and we wish her nothing but the best. Um, and again, there is always a spot for her here on yes. the podcast. We love yeah, Becca. Becca's wonderful. And listeners, your homework for next week and the next few is 1988's Final Friends, number one, The Party. And what I mean by the next few is we are going to run the trilogy over the next three episodes. So if you don't like Final Friends, I guess you can take a few weeks off. <laughs> but if you do, we're going to hit all three in a row. So dig them up, everybody. Even if you don't like the books, maybe we won't like them either. So you can yeah, just possible. them with us. You know, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes us hating a book is more entertaining than us loving it. Yeah, so definitely don't take a break. Stay with us. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done, Cassie. I, I was telling people not to listen. You're right. That was stupid. Cooper's like, get out of here, you guys. You have to tune in to see what you guys think and say about it. I That's mean, true. That's yeah. True. You might really disagree with us and want to fight us on Twitter. It's true. So tune in to fight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, until then, listeners, pleasant dreams. Woo. You survived the night, friends. You can peek out from under your covers and see the first blues of dawn out the window. Thanks for spending the night with the Pikecast, and we hope you'll join us again next time. Until then, Pikers, pleasant dreams.